You're listening to the Cantina Cast. Your home for thought provoking Star Wars talk. Join Adler and Jonesy in breaking down the latest news, trailers, movies, and of course, your favorite characters from a galaxy far, far away. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cantina Cast. My name is Albert Padilla. And this is a bonus episode where tonight we're going to be talking about the rebellion that will be televised, which is the title of the Vanity Fair, let's just call it a news story, news break that happened earlier today and uh, was chock full of all kinds of clarifying details. I think we got some new information all focused around the onslaught of television that is coming our way thanks to Star Wars and Disney+. Plus. Uh, on top of that, we had a couple other big announcements, I think, that were fairly large announcements that happened that were semi-related and some that were unrelated to the novels um, or, sorry, into the uh, the Vanity Fair announcement. So we felt, given the topics and given just how hot some of this stuff is, we had to talk about it, and, and particularly around some of the comments that were made uh, by some of the executive producers and some of the actors and uh some stuff may or may not be controversial. We're going to find out here in a little bit. And speaking of controversial, Jonesy is here with us tonight. Welcome, Jonesy. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing well, sir. How about yourself? I'm doing good. I, I, I mentioned earlier on Twitter that it's just been brain overloaded with like Star Wars news. It just felt like one thing. It's like that Vince McMahon like meme where it's like different <laughs> stages. That's how I was by the end of the day. Just, you know, right. head back. and It's going to be one of those nights myself. where it's really hard to fall asleep tonight. There's just so much rolling through our heads and mm-hmm. all the things that happened. And gosh, I, I mean, it, it doesn't even stop with just the news aspect or even with the show, like the tonight's episode. It's just, you know, the books and everything else coming out. It's just a nonstop deluge. This is great. I mean, this yeah. is fantastic. And we got a, a bit of an actual roadmap here for probably the next 12 months too, which is kind of nice. Yeah, no, if you, yeah, exactly. We can start um, to assemble like actually what the next 12 months of content actually looks like. Yeah, and it is. Pretty exciting stuff. I mean, there were some things that got switched around and uh, changed up as well, uh, which yeah. I felt like was uh, probably news, uh, certainly newsworthy, but things that we we had, I, I didn't have on my radar. So uh, it sounds like it's very fluid, or at least to some extent it's fluid. So, um, well, you know, before we get started, though, Albert, yeah, a very happy birthday to you and to, to Mike and to us. Oh, that's Yesterday right. Yesterday was the that's Canteen of Cast's 11th birthday. So, yeah. Uh, again, a huge congratulations to Mike, who you know started the show out 11 years ago and, and kept it running for so long and built it to where it is. So uh, thank you to, to him for all of the years of service, if you will. Mm. And to you, my good friend, who's also helped uh, doing a fantastic job of keeping the legacy alive. So Thank you. Yeah, I mean, my plan is to run this into the ground and we're um, not too we far are halfway away from there. That. Halfway yeah. there. Yeah. So no, congratulations to you. Happy birthday to you, Mr. Thank President. You. So I don't even know. I get like long. two birthdays within like two days. It's I know. So Jonesy's birthday is what? Two days from now. So no, it's tomorrow. Is it tomorrow? Wait, what's today? Oh, today's 17th. Sorry. Yeah. The 18th tomorrow. So uh, I don't know. We'll have to do a bonus show tomorrow. I'm kidding. <sighs> You'll but, probably make uh, me edit it too, won't you? <laughs> yeah. Happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday. <laughs> you get stuck with the edit. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. No. C- yeah. Congratulations to to Mike and appreciate all the efforts of everyone that's come before us and contributed to the show to make it su- make it a success. Uh, and especially to all of the the loyal listeners and supporters, because, uh, you know, without them, we wouldn't be doing this. Uh, maybe we yeah. would. I just don't know that we would go two hours long. Uh, we'd probably <laughs> go three or four. That. Or I'm, I, I just wouldn't just, put as much effort into editing the show. Yeah, is probably exactly. what happened. I probably will just text you, and that's about as far as the show goes. So. Right? Yeah, we'll just text back and forth. Yep. Right. So I'm gonna get into a little bit of news here. Oh, I think that's all we have. But yeah, what do we got first? Well, we got lots of book news, actually. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Del Rey is changing their names. You know, they've been largely known as Del Rey Star Wars. I guess I never mm-hmm. really called it that, but they are changing the name to Random House Worlds. So nothing really is changing. They're just kind of rebranding, you know, what they want, where they want to be. And I don't have the actual tweet. I had the tweet earlier about what, uh, what Alyssa Herbert's had out there. And they got a cool new logo. I think it's kind of nice. Looks yeah, good. it's World Between Worlds. No, I'm kidding. It's not. It's not even close. But It's very Star Wars-ish, though, I think. I think so. I think they're trying to, I mean, it sounds like they're, I mean, Del Rey Star Wars is very specific. Random House Worlds allows them to branch out and pull in bo- books from all kinds of universes world multiverses whatever uh under one title right it's very it's a clean way clean approach but beyond that like you said if you read this whole thing 
Uh, they even put an FAQ out, which I didn't really get into here. But for the most part, like really nothing is going to change right now. So that all makes sense to me. Kind of makes you wonder what else might be coming, though. That's, yeah. that's prompting that kind of change, right? Yeah. Now, Random House is still going to stay the same. So that still is the parent company. So yeah, Penguin no Random House still owns the world and yeah. everything that, that goes around in it. So uh, really nothing's changing. They might not even change the, uh, I, I think this will be the brand on the books. But as far as changing the website name or the social media and things like that, nothing is changing for a while at the very least. Yeah. I'd imagine that stuff will get rebranded at some point, but yeah. they're going to they're gonna ease into that as most we companies would do. We won't see the change on the books until 2023, I believe, is what they said. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So it's still a little way. I mean, they literally just announced it. And that's about it. Yeah. So they have, uh, so within like that division. Minecraft, Stranger Things. Mm-hmm. Uh, Garfield. I don't know who's reading those books. Uh, Magic the Gathering. I don't even know what some of these are. Critical Role, I know. You know what Magic the Gathering is. Oh, no. I know what that. I said Garfield. I didn't. Oh. Yeah. I know what I know. Well, you don't know what Garfield is either? No, I don't know Lore Olympus. How about that one? All these other ones I know. What is Lore Olympus? I don't know. I, I'm sure we have a loyal listener out there that probably loves that series, whatever it might be. Yeah. And I'm not, there's no shade here. I just, I'm not familiar with it. Yeah. So, but the point is, this allows them to house all of these various different titles across multiple IPs under one brand without coming up with specific uh, logos and all that. So Delray is going away. Uh, Dale's asking there in the chat, I think. But, uh, but yeah, everything else stays the same. So that's cool. But on top of that, oh, man, I made a I made a I did a bad thing today. So you certainly did, because this book is not cheap. <laughs> so they uh, for anybody that's. Uh, uh, n hasn't been following out of print out of print does some really great books. I think we've ordered a, a number of them now uh, for the high Republic and they've done other things and they, they carry more than star Wars books, but they have an exclusive license as does like Goldsboro and brand, uh, you know, really Barnes and Noble shop of all things. Well, it is, but I mean, it's, I don't know. They, it is a t-shirt shop and they have some pretty cool t-shirts uh, and not too, I mean, comparatively speaking, they're not much more priced than some of the other ones, to be honest. Right. Right. Uh, but they went all out on Thrawn Ascendancy book three. And I'm, I pulled up the front of the cover here. Uh, this went on sale today, I think at 10 a.m., if I'm not mistaken, you can see it there. I mean, it's got like, a, it's got a what, hard jacket that it's, you know, sleeve or whatever that slides into a bookcase, if you will. Uh, it's got like the gold foil, but it's red foil. It's got the gold on the, on the actual pages. Right, it's like, it's like beautiful, like Bible gold plated edges. Like you would see in a Bible. <laughs> like yeah. It, it's just nice and shiny. This is a beautiful book. I mean, they got the nice book three printing on the hard, on the uh, case to it, the sleeve. Mm hmm. Um, the inside's got the book plate, the blue yeah. book plate nice that's blue, signed. Yeah, yeah it's kind of cool. And Surprised then they even look, red, but still, it's so yeah, neat. true. I think they're going for the, uh, the chiss color, but, and oh, then yeah. here's the, uh, the inside's got this like nice little motif pattern going on there. So, all in, this thing went on sale for 150 bucks. Uh, it's sold out in three minutes uh, total time. And I, yeah. was think, I was debating whether or not I should do it. And I just, I started looking at these pictures and I'm like, oh, forget it. I'm just going to do it. I'm buying it. So I got my copy. Thankfully, uh, that'll be in sometime soon. Like these things are, there's no, like there's no hesitation. You're not pre-ordering for a run later down the road. So it should be, I would say in the next two weeks, hopefully I get it before um, celebration because I may pack this thing. And see if I can't grab a quick signature from Mr. Zahn uh, on this thing, because that would just kind of complete the deal for me. So that would be pretty amazing. Yeah, I mean, this is one of those things that's been delayed for a little while and you know, weren't totally sure when it was going to come up. But I, I believe they posted this over the weekend that it was coming out this week. But man, $150 book. Yeah, Jeff. <laughs> it may not be cheap, but it is a book. It's a book. That's right. Lauren says, make room on the bookshelf for a place of honor. Yeah. This is going to be right up there with, uh, and I've spent more on books, as some of you guys may know. I think I've shown some of the, um, like the uh, Secrets of the Sith, or not Secrets of the Sith, the Book of Sith, the enhanced version, Path of the Jedi, the really big ones. Uh, and I got two more. I showed Jonesy two other ones that I've never even opened. They're still sitting back here. So I need incredible, to get, folks. I need to get off my butt and do like a, a uh, unboxing of these things officially. So, but anyway, so yeah, this was, um, Cool book. Um, hopefully, I'll, I'll, I'll show it here or do something special with it at some point. And, and then you read Lesser Evil, period. Like the Thrawn Ascendancy series is really, really good. And I thought Lesser Evil was probably the best book of that trilogy, to be honest with you. Oh, well. I liked it a lot. I know Jeff's got my back down there. Yep. 
Yep. Chat. Uh, and then lastly, uh, if that oh, wasn't enough, we'll talk about this is the else. real exciting one. So we got our uh, advanced reader copies, our digital advanced reader copies for Secret of the Sith. Uh, this is the novel that will be out in June. In fact, this novel will be out June 28th. The embargo lifts on June 21st. Um, to be quite frank, I've, I've only, I mean, I haven't really looked a whole lot into this book. It had my interest when it was announced that Lando and Luke would be in here. And we figured U Uchi was going to be in there as well. Um, but beyond that, I hadn't looked really much into it. And I don't know, like, the, the, the email that we got had, like, one spoiler in there. And I don't know if we – I don't think we can talk about it because I haven't seen it publicized anywhere. So we won't mention it. But what I will say is – It almost seems like the blurb you would read, like, on Amazon. But it's – yeah, I mean, yeah, it's quite in-depth. Yeah. yeah. And um, I would – so when I saw that, I was like, wait, wait a second. This is not – I, I, I thought the book was much more limited. Let me just say that. Yeah, this is not the book I thought it was. I was very disappointed. I was not really excited about this book, but the more the information has come out and then with, with just the little brief little thing they gave us, my attitude has changed entirely. It was like, including a couple of the excerpts that they've already given us too. Yeah. I have not been able to put this down. Like I thought I was going to be, I was like, oh, I'll just get around to it. Maybe this weekend I read the first chapter and was like completely floored by the first chapter. Like what? And then by chapters three, this guy, Adam Christopher, who, by the way, he was a, I, I hadn't really seen much about him, but he is, uh, he was the, what was his empire, his debut novel uh, was Book of the Year in 2013, nominated for the Sir Julius Vogel Award for Best New Talent. He was shortlisted for his best novel. Uh, this guy has got some chops when it comes to writing, and he hooks you so hard by that third chapter that you don't want to stop reading because it's not, on the surface, yes, it's about Lando and Luke and uh, an, a Sith assassin. Wow, I was not expecting some of the other characters and some of the other things that they were introducing. So that's uh, that's all I can say so far right now. It's just, it's very addicting. Uh, and I'm going to try to plow through this as soon as possible because I can't put it down. So What sucks is you excited. have to wait a whole 30 plus days before know, we can even say same. anything about it. Which it's is so far I mean, It's there. awesome to be able to read it so far in advance, but this is the drawback too, is that, man, by the time we, but again, if you've already plowed through a, a good portion of it already. This is a book you're probably going to read at least two or three times. It sounds it's, like. it's quick too. It's very, very fast. I love books uh, like that, that you just never even realize how quick you're going through it. Yeah. It's quick and dense. Like you don't have to, I don't feel like I have to reread anything to really kind of understand what they're trying to say, but yet he's dropping like bombs one after another. And you're like, Whoa, wait, what, what? So like thought bombs, thought bombs. <laughs> he is a Sith Lord. Right. Um, okay. So anyways, I guess I'll say for now more to come. And then I, I went along with brotherhood. We will be doing some coverage of both of these books, uh, here shortly. Once we get, I really them. hope we get a physical copy of this book because that cover is just cool. The, the artwork on it is beautiful. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, I think that was it. Was it, we have anything else on news? I think that was it. Yeah. Okay. That was all there was. All right. Well, let's get into our main topic. Um, the rebellion will be televised. And uh, let's start with the pictures because, you know, pictures are always fun. Uh, let me pull those up real quick because there really weren't a whole lot of pictures that were released today, but some of them were pretty striking and, and certainly got our attention. So I'm going to throw them up and I apologize for anybody listening to the audio. Um, but here is the very first one. We had the cover. Um, it's got all the four primary characters, I would say, at this point going forward. We got Ahsoka, Din Djarin on there, uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and then my boy, Cassie and Andor. Excuse me. The, I, that wasn't a dramatic pause. I almost burped. Um, Cassie and Andor in the back. And I'll what I pull back the curtain. <laughs> yeah, I took the magic right out of that. You did. But, uh, what I said about this was I love the fact that they've got all, all these characters are from, you know, before the original trilogy and stories after the original trilogy. Right. So they're kind of, it's a pretty broad range of broadcasting net of characters that are being displayed here that we've got to look forward to. I mean, that's the thing, right? These are the characters we're going to be seeing here for the next year and a half at least of television um yeah. coming down the road so this bodes really well like we've got so much content here, content here to talk about and we knew this was going to come with it come to a head at some point we kept saying we're probably going to get choked out by the number of the, the amount of content that's coming out with star wars but it starts with these four but what are your thoughts seeing the this blue vanity fair cover first of all it's a beautiful cover and any leave of it's as usual completely knocked out this photo shoot i mean it's mm -hmm. just incredible she's a legend of course and been entwined with Star Wars and pretty much every other, you know, 
piece of photography you'd see in a magazine that you believe is amazing with you know, yeah. from any walk of life. And so she just absolutely does it. But it's really cool to see them all in one place, like all, all on the cover and in various stages. And then we get a few nice kind of surprises as we, as we kind of open the page and thumb through it a bit here too. If, well, not so much this one with Dave Filoni and John Favreau. <laughs> I mean, Deborah Chow's in there. That's kind of cool. And KK's there. Yep. Uh, but, but it's really cool to see the four prime, like you said, you know, four characters. We know that Obi-Wan's probably a one and done, but the other characters, again, this is potentially years of content that these guys are going to be around for mm -hmm. and that they're so in, engaged and intertwined with each other's material. It just makes sense that they all share a cover and it's live. It's not Photoshopped. They're all in the same room interacting. Yeah, this is, um, yeah, Ken's got it up. The volume is where they've taken this picture at. We'll, we'll may, we may touch on that just a little bit. We've covered it quite a bit here. Um, I don't think there was anything really new that came out that we had not spoken spoken about but they, they stress the importance of it yeah the, the different i mean it's, it's a game changer no make no mistake but yeah nothing really new about it i i, I seem to hyper focus on their shoes like filoni's got docs <laughs> which is kind of cool yeah Favre's like, got Favre, the adidas going. Got, i got the same adidas and i'm thinking okay so we're bros right there um and, and kathleen's kind of she's playing you got the same pants as kk as yeah the same pants and uh, both chow and i are wearing the same shirt tonight so it's kind of awkward but i got and i've got the same hair as deborah chow <laughs> there we go and I've, you probably have that hat too somewhere. I've seen you wear that. The cowboy hat? Yeah. No, not you. Uh, okay. No, I got boots, but I don't have the cowboy hat. Yeah, I got boots too. But this is, um, I mean, this is the, uh, again, the future of it. Now, you made a comment about, um, you know, these are, this. Oh, I can't remember what the comment was, but what it would what maybe think of it, what, what made me think attention. of, yeah. <laughs> it made me think of the fact that there is something a little bit later that we're, we're going to talk about uh, with regards to, who are the future producers and directors and, and some of the challenges that Kathleen Kennedy has faced in all that. Um, it's kind of sobering to some extent. It is eye opening. I think for me, I think we've kind of talked around it, but never really addressed it directly the way she did. And it mostly because it was probably speculation on our part, but it was good to hear some confirmation on some of those things. So more on that in just a little bit, but let's move on past uh, this. And yeah. Yeah. Hayden Christensen, little, uh, little practice duel in here with the, I like that he actually practiced with a piece of material behind him, like a cape. Mm. And the way that, I mean, this is a staged photo shot, by the way. This isn't them actually like super practicing and whatnot, but, and this is a, oh, a Ewan McGregor stunt double. So it's not really Ewan over there on the left, but very much Hayden Christensen though. Yeah. It looks like they have fans too. So, I mean, the fans were probably brought in to blow the cape while he was stepping yeah. forward. So um, it's a very striking like image though. I mean, again, oh, nice. Just, I'd like to see what you did there. Striking image. See? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what kind of boots is he wearing? Oh, he's just uh, using combat boots. Yeah. yeah. Barely laced. So this is, uh, this is good stuff. I mean, it's always good to see him doing anything. Uh, and man, his, uh, his interviews have been really touching lately too. I don't know if anybody's been following all they're on the, uh, the press tour right now for Kenobi and, uh, he, you know, the same questions keep coming up for him and we, and we probably should have added something like this in the notes. Maybe we can just talk about it now, but it just, it's very, uh, it's, it's very touching again to see how much people are starting to really appreciate the prequels. And I really, at some point need to just talk about this and I don't know if we do it on a show or I just go on a rant. Uh, but I've got a lot to say about the hate that came during the prequels and how most of those people now, like some of the people I know hated the prequels are about as two faced as you can possibly be. And I just, it's just, it bothers me. So, because a lot of these people didn't deserve what they got in terms of, you know, Hayden Christensen and, and even Jake Lloyd. Um, I mean, even about. Ewan McGregor to an extent, right? Oh. I mean, Ewan McGregor has stated recently that after the first movie, after episode one, he didn't really want to come back and do it. But when you're under contract, you're under contract. <laughs> yeah. They, I mean, they had to, right? Uh, but I mean, he was the worst, very disappointed with the, with the way it was received. Yeah. And, and the worst, I mean, we're not even, I, I would say Hayden and Jake were probably up there, but I'm odd best. I mean, oh, this gosh. guy was about ready yeah. to kill himself. And there's uh, an interview out there where he was talking about how he took a oh, picture. Oh, Last Celebration. It was very much front and center with all my best. Yeah. Yeah. He went out and a took a picture. story. Took a picture of uh, himself with his son, thinking that was going to be the last picture he took because he was going to jump off a bridge at that point. Um, so it just kind of shows you what uh, what this fandom, like the, the, the horrible people that do exist in this fandom, and they are out there. They're already at it. Like, uh, not – I – um, one of the forums that I follow, someone wouldn't took a picture, uh, like a pen 
and they made a red mark over Kathleen Kennedy and then reposted and said, there, I fixed it. And then some, they used the B word on her and some other stuff. And I said, wow, you know, the only thing I said was, wow, it's still shocking to me that this many years later, we still have people, grown ass men, excuse my language, that are crybabies and hate Kathleen Kennedy and blame her for everything to the point where they're Xing her name out. And that tells me that they just have so much growing up to do and that they are the worst of the worst. Uh, and they are still stuck in early stages of grief. They just cannot mentally and emotionally get past it. Um, so, sorry, so not to not to go on a soapbox there, but it's just it, that speaks to what happened to these characters. And then we saw it with like uh, Kelly Marie Tran. Uh, name it, name most of the new characters. They all went through various cycles, especially you know Daisy Ridley with Ray and and all that. So, anyways, maybe twenty years from now, this will be a there'll be a renaissance for the sequel trilogy. In fact, I will predict right now. 20 years from now, there will be a renaissance for the sequel trilogy as much as uh, people. I don't know this article really helped that, but yeah. (laughs) Um, Well, maybe. Uh, I think, again, I think just a a brief mention of that. If you're going to give people the criticism, you have to give them the, you have to be fair about it. And you have to, I mean, I say this like I'm a reasonable person, you know, but you have to (laughs) give them the credit when they do something right. Mm -hmm. You know, and if we talk about Kathleen Kennedy, I mean, why do you think Favreau and Filoni are involved? You know, she went and found them. She went and approached them. She went and engaged with them and had conversations and organized these things to come together to start the things that we're enjoying now. And this article did paint a few things in a, in a newer light for me as well. Some which I wasn't as thrilled about, at least maybe how I was put, but at the same time also gave some better context. I think you were leading in with some of this of, uh, of a new appreciation of how these things come together and kind of the timing of when all that happens too. And and what goes in that? And we'll talk a little bit more as we as we go on here about the the hiatus and whatnot. Yeah, here's uh, the next picture we have is um, uh, John Favreau holding the child, aka Baby Yoda, aka you know who, you know who. I like the, the article. They called it the pistachio colored. <laughs> I was like, wow, yeah. that's different. Yeah. And they they had mentioned that they wanted him to be cute, but they didn't want him to be too cute. And I think they blew it because this guy is way too cute for me. But uh, right, they actually wanted. They said that they tried to make him like somewhat ugly. Like, well, you failed miserably. Yep. yep. We should criticize you on the internet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're gonna criticize. <laughs> you him. made him too cute. Too cute. It's like an Ewok. So yeah, um, they they did talk about the because uh, we're not gonna talk about this when we get down to the other part of it, but just that uh, you know, Filoni was really skeptical about whether or not oh, he did not he was gonna him. work. Yeah. Like he was I mean, he's comes from the Lucas mind of we don't touch Yoda, we don't talk about Yoda, right? It's just right. he's he's sacred. And Fabro was really wanting to push forward with this. And so he, you know, finally he jumped in. I mean, it was a healthy debate. They got through it and uh, you know. We know now that this was a success. I mean, this is a global phenomenon. So, well, again, they both got on the same page that Favreau respects that position too. Of, look, I don't want to peel back the curtain and give everybody all the information. I think that was what was most important to Filoni. Was and again, he was trying to also weigh how would fans react to this because it is a holy character in so many different ways. You know, both figuratively and literally. Mm. And for you to tread on any of that is very dangerous territory. And I think Filoni was, you know, very representative of that beyond what how George Lucas viewed the, uh, you know, the, the character. But I think the way they did it, they really didn't give you a whole lot of extra context. Yeah. You know, but it makes sense that there's another one in the galaxy, though. Yep. Why right, would there not be? Right. And now, this uh, was cool. That's got to be Hayden in the Vader costume, right? It is. Yep. yep. Yeah. That was confirmed in the uh, BTS stuff that was released. But that is definitely uh, Hayden Christensen. He doesn't look as tall. As I would expect them to, but I'm not going to harp on that. Whatever, because um, Vader's supposed to be like over seven feet tall. Maybe he is. Maybe you. Maybe I can't remember how how tall, um, you and McGregor is. I think he's like six feet. Maybe. Uh, I think I don't. Uh, maybe, but I mean, Hayden Christensen's taller than you and than you and is. Yeah. As so I yeah. imagine, with the boots and the the helmet. Again, this is tough because perspective is a little right. bit off. But yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. So we got that. Um, I'm glad Reva's getting some FaceTime here too. She wasn't really mentioned a whole lot, but I was glad that she's in the article again. It just continues to cement her importance in the series coming up. Man, I saw her interviews have been really great. Uh, Moses Ingram, um, she, again, on that press tour, I've seen her on a couple different interviews and she looks like she's just having the time of her life. Uh, and I didn't even realize that she was in 
the Netflix series um, for, I forget what it was called now. Um, Queen's Gambit. Queen's Gambit. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. The chess one, which was amazing. I really enjoyed that, that series, but uh, I didn't realize that was her. Um, she looks completely, obviously because she's got different hairstyle going on here, but um, yeah, I'm pretty excited about her character. It does sound like she is going to be a more formative figure than just a side character. And again, like we, like we predicted, maybe she taps out around episode three or four, like most probably will at that point for the most part. Um, but it does sound like she's going to be up and center, uh, front and center here for the first couple, at least, if not three episodes. So excited. And then the last picture, um, we've got Mon Mothma played yeah, by. Mon Mothma's getting all the thirst online. For that. Yeah, there are people like Stan accounts going up left and right right now. So, <laughs> Um, uh, Genevieve uh, O'Reilly or Gen what's her last name? Why is oh my gosh! Yeah, I can't remember her last name. Genevieve, Genevieve, Genevieve. She was the one in Rogue One, but I, I can't remember right. her last name. Um, of course, Cassian Andor, played by Diego Luna, and uh, Pedro Pascal, um, and Ahsoka. That yeah, Rosario Darson. Yeah. Yep. Well, and and you and confirmed that uh, Mary Elizabeth Winstead is going to be in Ahsoka as well. Oh yeah. His partner, not wife, but partner. I think they secretly got married, though. Did they? Didn't they? Well, they just had a kid. I don't know. Well. And I thought I heard that they recently, like, they got secretly married, too. He referred to her as my partner in the interview. Um, yeah. but, but who knows when the interview actually took place. That's they literally, true. I think If they got married, I think it was literally just in the last couple of weeks. Oh. So some of the, well, why don't we, tra any, any other thoughts before we transition to the, the interview and no. anything on the pictures? We're getting some clarity here. Hayden is about 6'2", Ewan's about 5'10". So, okay. yeah, it's a big difference. Thanks, Dale. Um, I am, let's see. Oh, and Ken's uh, all up in his business, too. Says, buried now. Yeah. So, Just in the last few <laughs> we, weeks. We had everything covered. Everything is covered. Yeah, well, so the interview um, was done in, <clears throat> parts of it were done in March of this year. So, maybe during that line, when he was captured to say, my partner... Uh, they were not officially married just yet. So uh, some of it was in March, some of it was pretty recent. It was just kind of a conglomerate of things. And this did get cleared up in another set of news that was released this, this afternoon around 3 p.m., but we'll more on that here. I love how bit. Jeff's calling me out. It's not a secret marriage if Jonesy knows. That's true. That is, that is 100% true. I'm yep. usually one of the last to know almost everything. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true as well. Uh, okay, so do you, let's, let me just, I don't know, there's really, I'm going to roll this. Um, there's really not a whole lot to, to talk about here, but I just thought it'd be fun to show the BTS stuff with Andy Leibovitz. Uh, there was no big kind of a... You know, fun to see they're going to take down us. Let me turn this down. So again, nothing new, but cool to see, you know, behind the scenes stuff's always fun to watch, especially when everybody's kind of laughing, having fun. I don't know if he caught like Diego Luna was, or no, it was Pedro Pascal was kind of dancing at one point in the background and uh, just cutting up and getting, hanging loose. So fun stuff. And I think that's one of the interesting parts of the article. I'm glad you mentioned fun because Kath Kathleen Kennedy talks about that where, you know, the movies, when they were making the movies, it seemed like they had lost that spark. Mm -hmm. You know, they were churning movies out every year. I mean, we were, you know, we, we had talked about this way back when, and I know the guys did before us of, you know, is it, is it overload? Is it too much? And, you know, I think that they did start to see that it, it really wore on their psyche. And so what they're trying to do now is really re make sure that even though these are stressful and they take a lot of work, a lot of effort, 
make sure that the fun is still there and it comes across because when you are having fun, it, it does come across into the work and it can be the difference between a good show and a great show. Yeah. And so I think that's really something important that you know, they, they identify. Those are the small things that can really make a huge difference. Yeah, I think so. I think you're hundred percent right. I think some of that does bleed onto the screen, even though we want to think of those folks as professionals somewhere that tone um, can seep in. Um, and we've seen that affect all kinds of movies and TV shows in the past. So it's not just pure conjecture on our part. I think that's pretty well documented. That is a possibility. So, um, okay, well, let's, let's talk about um, the different pieces of this article. Now, this article really kind of covered a lot of the, all the shows that we know that are coming out. Um, it did mention one show without a title a little bit later that we'll, we'll discuss, but for the most part, I guess this was a lot more clarification on things. Um, and kind of where I wanted to start was, I think we got some pretty solid confirmations about what the, uh, genesis of all of this was. And it really kind of harks back to underworld, you know, the 50 scripts that were written, the 50 plus hours of footage that they had in their head. Um, you know, there was that test footage that was out there, but really this is where that all started. Uh, we got confirmation that uh, they had 130 subscribers now, 130 million, not 130, 130 million subscribers. And um, the the era of movies, at least as we know it, has been put on hold. It is on a hiatus, They although they did announce that they have a plan for what the movies are going to look like. That sounds like it's pretty far out, and that's fine. We've got plenty of Star Wars between now and then to, to tide us over. Um, but they had to regroup after the movies. And we again, we knew that this, this was going on. Uh, there was a lot of speculation, pushback, a lot of, uh, negative feedback about pausing things the way they did. But I did get a sense from reading the article that, you know, she made a mention, not in the, in the concept context of the article, she talked about, you know, learning from your mistakes. And, um, that wasn't specifically, uh, again, that wasn't specifically aimed at, Hey, you know, are we turning movies out too quickly per se? But I think overall, I think they realize that. And you couple that with Iger coming in, putting his foot down, saying, look, the, you know, the way forward, the path forward is now through television. And on top of that, we have got a global pandemic that is probably going to put people out of the theaters for quite some time. All of that kind of came together and it really kind of spurred and brought life to the this Star Wars television era that we're in now. Right. And I think, and Kathleen Kenny had a really good summary of that, is that George Lucas wanted, I mean, he grew up on the serial television, the cliffhangers, right? The Flash Gordons, all of this is all so well documented. And television, you know, television really fits that, that serialized episodic storytelling type of thing. And so it was really important that they, they, they find a avenue back to that, you know, to try to capture that spirit of Star Wars, I think, in particular. And I think it's really important for them to understand that I'll just use her words here that, that she had put it in uh, and put in her, uh, you know, we needed to all work together to create the architecture for where we were going. And this requires a three, four or five year commitment. You know, you can't step in, do it for a year or so and jump out. It really is, it works best. I mean, you can, but it works best if you have commitments and you have a longer term commitment that you can. And if we look at like Kevin Feige and some of the people they've had involved in the Marvel side, like we were talking about last week in our Patreon episode, you know, those types of things are important because you get that consistency, you get that, you know, that, that overall vision, that, that umbrella strategy that, that really makes everything fit together, you know, and yeah, sure things are not going to work out here and there, but if you still have a direction you're going and you're right with the pandemic, Bob Iger's, you know, investment into Disney plus and getting that stood up as quickly as possible and being okay with taking the loss you know, early on has paid huge dividends and I think has really saved Star Wars, I think, in many regards from the path that it was going where it seemed like more of a cash cow than an actual investment uh, type of franchise. They were just mm -hmm. trying to milk it for what it had and ringing, you know, ringing the cloth rather than actually investing in it and helping build it and making it grow. Yeah. And, and so I'm happy that they've made, they've, they've seemingly learned lessons from that. I, I, I'm, I'm glad she mentioned some of those things. And uh, now granted, some of the comments were a little bit mixed with some other things in there too, that we'll talk about, but I'm really happy that we've seen this turn around. And I think for Kathleen Kennedy to, to admit that though, I think is a really big thing. And I think when you, when you criticize someone like Kathleen Kennedy for where she's, you know, for, for the, some of the things that people don't like with the sequel trilogy in particular, you know, these are the things that she's recognizing. And as a leader, as the president of the company, 
you have to step in and do something and you don't always notice this right away. And sometimes like we're seeing here, it takes years for that strategy and for that vision to really take root to where you can look back for the last year, year and a half and say, wow, we've really got a lot of good stuff. Yeah. Who knew we were on this path if we didn't have these, these moments of, you know, disappointment you know, mm -hmm. to really learn from and grow from. I, the, the part that was kind of eye opening for me, there was a lot of criticism coming from Lucasfilm uh, and Disney, particularly at Kathleen Kennedy for the number of directors and producers and writers that were kind of rolling. They roll in and roll right back out. Right. Yeah. And uh, it, it wasn't in this interview, but uh, and I, I, sh I should mention. So the, the what happened is that so we had this early this morning around 9 a.m. Central Time, I think, is when that this all this kind of broke. And uh, it was just a flood of information. It was all I mean, it was all the chatter. And then uh, Anthony Bresnikan and Adam Lance Garcia, who are both writers at Vanity Fair, posted something saying, hey, later today at 3 p.m., we've got even more. And that turned into something they were calling uh, Beyond the Cover Page, I think is what it was called. I mean, I probably have the title wrong. Uh, but nonetheless, it was a an extension of this. It was almost like Bresnikan would do the same thing when he was over at Entertainment Weekly where he would make this quick announcement like this. And then there was a couple of videos that followed that teased up a number of things and expanded upon it with, you know, expanded upon some of these bullets with more clarity. And this is one of the ones that was expanded upon. And that was that they were rolling through a lot of these directors and because it is a commitment, right? It, like you said, it is a four to six year commitment. Kathleen in that part of the interview said it could be up to 10 years that some yeah. of this stuff that they're, that they're locked in for. So if you think about it from that perspective, Bring it in directors and producers, especially if they're really hot. People want them on different projects and they want to explore different projects. Right. I mean, that's, you know, I think that what the comment that was made that these guys only have so many years that they're really kind of, you know, focused on and people hold them in high, high regard and high light. Right. Unless you're one of the great all time folks that just keep doing movies. And so they've got to be really picky and they've got to be really they have to pick and choose what they want to do. And, and signing up for a six to 10 year commitment, that's major. That's huge. That extends into the the producers. It extends into staff. It extends into the actors themselves. And it uh, controls you know, your life. I mean, and Diego Luna made a, a comment similar to that about, wow, I've got to uproot my life in a completely different country, mm -hmm. you know, for a huge amount of time. When I, my, that's not where my family is. That's where my, not where my life is. Yeah. And you know, when he had to go do this uh, and or in London when he's in Mexico. Yeah. So, so this commitment isn't the only factor that uh, plays into whether or not these directors come on and stay on, but it is one of the contributing factors. And, and depending on who it is and what they want and all that, um, it could be a major contributing factor to it. So, um, so I, again, not, uh, not to excuse anything. I think they, they probably, again, lessons learned in some of that for them, but they are at least acknowledging now that this is what it's going to take. And so when you think about the next movie that's coming out, like it's going to be Taika Waititi's movie, which I thought was interesting that they announced that officially, uh, right. that was, that was going to be the next movie. And she mentioned John Favreau and that John Favreau has like cleared his schedule. Like when the Mandalorian started and said, this is all it I'm in, I'm, com I'm completely committing myself to this. And that has been a blessing because without that, think about it, without that, we've not, maybe, you know, season two of Mandalorian may not be as good as it was, or we may not have gotten the book of Boba Fett in that kind of uh, format or may have gone a different way, but having that consistency there has really been crucial for somebody like maybe Dave Filoni to bounce ideas off of or Kathleen Kennedy, right? You have a team that's committed. Uh, if I could use a sports analogy, it's like you get a good group of people together for one good season and then suddenly everybody goes off and signs free agency because they all became popular and they leave the team. It's essentially what's exactly what kind of happens there. You lose that core structure and you're sometimes you get put on your heels trying to figure out how do we replace these folks? How do we bring back the magic and how do we, you know, how do we retain these people? Um, so all of those challenges play into it. Now for us, all we see is, oh, they just keep turning over producers and turning over writers and directors and boy, they can't get their crap together. And that's a little bit more nuanced than that is all I'm saying. Any other, do uh, you have any other thoughts on this before we move, roll into the. I'm just wondering where we're going to rip the bandaid off of Solo. <laughs> oh, we can talk about Solo now. Um, so one of them, I mean, it fits with the, you know, with the lessons learned, right? Because I think that was the, they, they framed the lessons learned within the context of re, of uh, both the, you know, what do you do with the original cast members, you know, who, who you'd love to bring into the, to the movies and to the material, but they're, 
you know, quite a bit older than what you're, what you would be doing in this material and that we've seen how deep fake works and we've seen these other things, but also the, the challenges you can have recasting. Now, the issue I had with this com or the way that it was, I don't know if this was actually how Kathleen Kennedy said it, or maybe it's how Bresnikan structured this, but it really did seem, and a lot of people online have taken it this way. So I'm not alone in at least having an inkling about this. We could think critically about this though, is that it seemed like a slight at solo, you know, and maybe in particular at Alden Heinrich with, with the performance of, you know, trying to replace Han or Harrison Ford, right. As Han Solo, it's huge shoes to fill and, and all of that. So there's been a huge outpouring of support for, you know, for solo. And of course, a lot of hashtag make solo to happen, but you know, it, did you take it as a, a bit of a, a dig at solo of, of that's why it wasn't financially successful. I mean, cause I've, I saw a couple of other, you know, articles or, you know, kind of reactions to it. And it just oversimplified why Solo wasn't financially successful. It didn't take any context or it took not all the context into consideration when, when these types of comments were made about why it didn't do as well as it you know, was hoped to have. Yeah. But did, did you take kind of a negative reaction or what was your response in your head, at least, and maybe after your time to think about it? So initially, yes, but this is one of the clarifying, they spend about probably five minutes clarifying the context of this interview. And particularly this question in the bonus of uh, stuff. So that is uh, that was in total about an hour long. Um, and the, this question came up directly from somebody in the audience and basically said, "Hey, what uh, was this a slide on on um, Aldrin and you know solo itself?" What I would the way I feel about it now is I get what she's saying. Um, do I agree with it? I don't. I don't think that she was never saying that this was the that. She was never saying that was the whole, that was the only problem. Uh, I think people jump to that and I think it's fair because of the way there's nothing else that's provided outside of that quote in that, in that article. Yeah. But th the context of that question was whether or not they should go the, uh, here, let me look at my notes. So the context of the question was whether or not, was it a character, a person, not, not um, Alden himself, but just a person versus a CGI deep fake slash uh, you know, voice synthesized thing, right? Kind of character. Yeah. And the distinguishing factor with her in the context of that conversation was what she was saying is if it's a character that's going to come on and do a cameo appearance like a Luke Skywalker in the book of Boba Fett, they felt like deep fake right now, based on the technology, deep fake tech, tech is the way to go. They wouldn't recast somebody for something like that physically going forward. With the with Solo, she says that uh, had they done that again, because it was a longer piece of it, they probably would have brought another actor in. So it wasn't, again, feedback at him. They don't I guess what the part that I did have a problem with the conflict that I have is when they started bringing up questions about like, well, what about Lando and what about Kenobi? Like you think about you McGregor, right? Yeah. We everybody focuses on. On uh, Alden, but really, you and McGregor was the first one. How did fan, how were fans going to receive somebody like Obi Wan K Kenobi? Now, in the context of that conversation, because I was there and I clearly, distinctly remember the context of that conversation, it was well, Obi Wan Kenobi was a character that was on screen for all of about whatever minutes. As much as you might love him, as much as 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 huge as he was, he didn't have you know as much content on screen content and acting and, and all that, that somebody like Harrison Ford did with Han Solo. Right. So is it an apples to apples? I don't know. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, but I, he did stress over and over again that there wasn't any shade being, he never picked up any sense of shade being thrown at Solo, the movie, the directors, especially not the actor uh, for, for what he did. Um, but I, I would say this, the way I would summarize, it wasn't clear to me when they would and when they would not use it. I feel like they're leaning more towards uh, doing more deep fake stuff and not casting actors because of the feedback and because they feel like they can get a more, um, a better characterization by doing that than having an actor do it. What's that? More authentic, I guess. Yeah, I, I, it's, authentic sounds like, I mean, that authentic, it's, 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 a, it's a good word, but then the, you think of the inverse of that being as like fake, right? Or non-authentic. And that seems like a slight towards the actors themselves. Uh, I had a, I can't, there well, was a good something word you I had have more head, but, Well, I, I use authentic because it's more something you have, you have a direct control over. Yeah. You, you, you have a lot more 
I don't want to say flexibility, but you have a lot more direct input on the performance itself if you're really synthesizing 80% of it, mm -hmm. you know, except the physical person making the mannerisms, and that's about it. Because, I mean, even the voice is now, you know, somewhat overlaid and synthesized. So, yeah. Uh, I don't, I, don't, I mean, I, I kind of get where that's all at. The words in the article certainly suggest something else, you know, when, when they make a comment of, you know, the film has its admirers, but it made less at the box office than any other live action Star Wars movie. Solo swagger may be too singular for another actor to replicate. But that is, is that Anthony saying that or? or? That's Bresnikin saying that. And okay, then he yeah. goes into the Kennedy quote, there should be moments along the way where you learn things. Now it does seem so abundantly clear that we can't do that, whatever that might be referencing, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's just, maybe it's the way that paragraph is assembled. You know, it, it's, I don't, I like, and Jeff's making a great contact here, or, con or a comment here about context. You have to understand context. It, it's so important. If brotherhood has taught me anything, it's about context <laughs> lately with, uh, with reading Mike Chen's book, but you have to keep context into perspective, but writing an article where you just kind of jump into it, lay a bit of a bomb and then jump out of it. It's easy to really take all the context out of that and get the reaction we had today when I got to be honest, I don't mind recasting actors, especially if it's a different stage of that air of that actor's life, especially if you're having to go back in time. And I think this was far back enough to where, you know, Aaron Reich's performance was, I thought as good as you could expect and hope. And I thought captured the character very well for a character that was, you know, several, many years before the character we saw on screen in 1977. Yeah. That's me. The, I'll, I'll get off my soapbox about it, but it was, it's a bit irritating when we continue to go back and revisit some of this stuff. Although I know it's a hot button topic and it is important to understand where they're coming out from it. Honestly. Yeah. So the context of that, I don't know if this was in, I have this in my notes from the, the extended interview or the commentary. But um, it says we can't do something with Luke Skywalker without Mark Hamill. We're not going to suddenly do that. So that's the context of that. We're not going to suddenly do that. But they basically have. Hamill is there in person-ish, but really they're doing it without Mark Hamill. So I don't, the, the, the comment just seems like it's a bit inaccurate to my perspective. We, we can move on from all of this, but it's just a, it's an interesting debate. You know, well, here, here's the other thing that came up that I, that I think maybe will make people feel better about it. Okay. Uh, there, it doesn't sound like they're going to backpedal. They're not going to, they're not going to go back now. Let's, and the example that was used was, okay, so let's say they move forward with Lando, right? Although something else that came up in this, in that post interview was Lando is not like Donald Glover is not officially confirmed anywhere, right? This is purely speculation that well, he would be back. Well, they Donald used Glover this, saying it on but Late there's show. nothing so in that yeah exactly but in this interview she is saying they have no contract with him right now right she's on record as saying that so yes maybe he is coming back well, that's not the point the point is yeah. if they did bring him back and you've got to assume that with a lando you're probably going to have a han solo so what i think what she was also saying and again this is me listen to it to your for yourself um and by the way the inter one of the th articles that's going to be coming out over the next 7 days is an extended more contextual interview with Kathleen Kennedy. So he, he kept saying, well, I'm saving this. Don't worry. You, this will all make itself. It'll, it'll probably be all right. Uh, once we get there. So more to come on this, but the way I was kind of, um, the way I was capsulating what he was saying was they're not going to go back and do a CGI deep fake of Harrison Ford and put that up against the character of Donald or Donald Glover's portrayal of Lando Calrissian, right? Yeah, that, that would be a slap in the face. Yeah, he's in it. Like, they're not going to go back. It's all they're talking about is moving forward, given the where the technology is going, how fast it's growing. That is the path forward rather than trying to recast and get into sticky situations where people, you know, have this. It's like you said, they, you can, we'll just create it. I mean, I know it sounds controversial maybe, or it sounds unorthodox, but is as much as that is it was the same scenario that we had back in you know 1999 with cgi backgrounds and look at all the flack george lucas was getting about making fake movies and all these aren't real movies because you don't have backgrounds and you're just using green right. screen everywhere and that's not real movie making and you know look where that's got us now that's all we do that is the future. i mean yeah even me mcgregor had a lot of comments to say about it yeah recently as well <laughs> so we'll see i mean Again, I don't, there wasn't, was there wasn't a clear indicator or a clear needle that said, this is when, 
or if we're going to do it, this is when we're not going to do it. It just sounds yeah. like the path forward is from now on, any opportunity that we get, we're, we're going to do the CGI deep fake. And I'm, I'm happy with that. Like I think Jeff said too, like in whatever format we get a, a, a new uh, story of Han Solo or any of the characters, I'm, I'm in. I mean, that's fine. Yeah. Um, Okay, so let's uh, let's see. So we were talking about uh, was there anything else on this one? Yes, we talked about. It. Let's talk about Kenobi since that is um, obviously just on the horizon, less than ten days, I believe, as of today, right? Yeah. Um. So we talked. Uh, they were uh, in this interview. They kind of talked about the the journey, and you know, we all know the story of McGregor being told and you know, asked if he would ever come back, and him saying yes. And uh, I think we we got word that. Officially, they called him up and said, hey, were you being serious about this? This is Carrie Hart, who was one of the producers at the time. And he's like, hell yeah, I'm in. And so that was going to be a movie. That movie obviously didn't happen. They had a reset. They took those stories back. Um, we know McGregor now was very, was very involved in the stories and providing feedback because um, he had a vested interest in, in coming back. What's interesting, though, too, and I don't know if it was in this interview or another one that I saw just recently. It was a behind the scenes or one of the press tours. But you know, there was a part of his life where, he, like many of the actors, he really just wanted to walk away. And at yeah. some point, he decided, I want to be back. I want to be a part of this. And when they asked him, like, what changed for you? Like, what was different? His answer was, as simple as this may sound, he just said, I got older. That was it. There was no, like, revelation in terms of, you know, story or, you know, there was something bad that rubbed him. He just, you know, got older and felt like, hey, I kind of want to do this. He's got kids now and you know, family. And there's, it's a, there's a long, I mean, his, his wife now is involved in it. His, what is his uncle was yeah. Wedge Antilles um, as well. Not literally Wedge Antilles, but uh, whatever his name is now. Uh, but yeah, so for him, it was just, you know, it was the right time. Um, so yeah, I mean, distance and time really do heal a lot of wounds, right? That nostalgic thing is really forever. Everyone has a, some sort of sense of nostalgia in some way or form. And I think, I think some of it though is also the, you know, the people, I think he mentioned this and we've seen this uh, for Hayden as well. And the people who grew up with those movies and you and I have talked about this extensively. Mm. Those are the people who really get you reinvigorated and re-energized for it that, yeah, for all the BS you took and all the criticism and the critique, you know, from critics and fans and whatever, the people who the films were for absolutely adore them. And they're the ones who have kept it alive and, and given it this re-renewal of life. And really put that straight into the actors that play those characters. And then that's why we're able to have these is because people like that. And you've said like this, you know, our kids these days who grow up on, you know, the sequels trilogy may have a very similar renaissance, you know, in, in 10 years from now and 15, 20 years from now where, where we start to see this, you know, a revisionist look at these movies to where even people go back and start re-reviewing them and re-rating them about, you know, how their perspective has changed on it. Yeah, and I hate to, as 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 blunt as this may sound, and as sobering as this may sound, the reason why this happens, and I saw it with the prequels, and I'm gonna, I know we're gonna see it with the sequel trilogy, is that when those when those kids grow up, although they appreciate and respect Star Wars, they they kind of don't care about the original trilogy, right? They don't really, they didn't care about the original trilogy so much when the prequel trilogy came out, and my my gut tells me that's gonna be the same way. They're going to watch the movies and they'll have fun. They'll have fans that will love all of them and, and die for a, an original trilogy, even though they grew up with the pre, the sequel trilogy. And there's always the exceptions. But what you tend to find is a lot of that we hold on to because we're holding on to those memories. Right. There was something special about that because we went through that as children. Absolutely. And so that gets in the way of us being objective about are these movies fun? Are they enjoyable? Are people going to appreciate these movies 10 years from now? And it's real easy to say, no, they're not. And this is trash and no one's ever going to like these. And it's an abomination. It's Kathleen Kennedy's fault and yada, 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 go on and on and on. But when you realize that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, these kids grow up, they're completely, at, they're, they're almost detached from the, all the stuff that we held on to. And all they've got left is the sequel trilogy and everything that's come out after it. That's their Star Wars. And that's exactly what we're going to see. I guarantee you that's going to happen because it's already happened once. It's history repeating itself. You can look at other honest. franchises as well. Sorry, I was just going to there are other franchises that fit into this as well. James Bond oh, sure. is a prime example. Ask somebody who their favorite Bond is. Yeah. Good luck gosh. with that one. Ask somebody yeah. what their favorite Trek, you know, captain of the uh, Starship captain Enterprise. Kirk. Yeah. Exactly. You're going to get different answers because they're all based on our own biasness and how we were, you know, what those things meant to us growing up and how they touched our lives. 
And let's be honest. I mean, the prequels, they were all Rick McCallum's fault anyway. So. <laughs> and we move on. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, I'm not. Albert told me to say it. No. But no, so I think uh, kind of back to the story, though, I think Ewan really, I always like it when they, they bring forward uh, the perspective of the character that they're wanting to portray and write the story and how they mentally, you know, visualize where the character's at. And so with Obi-Wan, you know, Ewan said, I think it would be, it should be a story about a broken man, a man who's lost his faith. Mm. He's always, he always has a funny line to say, or always seems to be calm and is a good warrior or soldier or whatever. But to see that man come apart and to see what gets him back together again, that's where we started. That's, and again, I think that was more with the, when they were still planning the movie. But I think that perspective still, you know, that, that pervades it, it, it constant all the way through the material here. And I think even when we see a, and hear a line like, you know, you know, the, the boy must be trained. Like when the time comes, the boy must be trained. When you have, you know, text context like that, or when you have a, a script like that, within that context, you can start to see why those types of things, that's where it's all starting from, mm -hmm. is where is Obi-Wan Kenobi and his idealism is still there, is not quite broken from him yet, but he's starting to lose hope and he's starting to lose faith. And what does that look like whenever you're torn down and you have to find a way to build yourself up? because there's no one else that's going to do it for you. Mm -hmm. And so I always love it when we get little pieces of that background information to help us understand where the character is at and what is it, where are they, what position are they in right now? Well, what I found also to uh, going back to like Deborah Chow, like she was, she's kind of like the showrunner for this. So like she's spearheading a lot of the storyline here. I mean, she uh, <clears> personally <throat> engaged with Hayden Christensen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like went over to crash on his couch and started talking about, Hey, you know, would you be willing to come back? Um, and had to sell him on that. But even before she got there, she had to sell the idea of Vader coming back. Like she had to sell that there was a story that needed to be told. And a lot of the, a lot of the, um, I wouldn't say pushback, but the conversation was really about what does it do for that moment in Star Wars episode four, as we've talked about many times, like, is, does that recontextualize that story in some way or that, that, that meeting and, and some of the dialogue that's spoken during that scene? Um, but eventually she won. Um, I don't think it was, I, they, they didn't say it was a hard fight, but you know, there were probably other thoughts about it. It doesn't sound like the original movie script had that as part of, um, the storyline. So glad to see that he did make it in there. And then of course, naturally going back to Hayden and bringing him in and just, I mean, I keep seeing all these, these, uh, interviews with Hayden Christensen and I feel, I feel bad for him on some, to some extent because he doesn't, he doesn't seem like as happy as he used to be. Right. He's grown up. I don't know what his life has been like, but I know he's he suffered a number of uh, tragedies as a result of doing the prequels. Uh, but I think he is very sincere and very genuine when he's talking about how much it means to him to see these people coming forward and saying, you change this. These movies changed my life and you were, you know, a hero to me growing up. And I love the character and I love the prequels. You know, we're, we're like we're like freaking celebrating the Clone Wars now. Right. And you think what Clone Wars was, I loved it. But man, oh, that guy. The clones? No, I'm talking about the Clone Wars. Oh. It's a, well, attack. Well, let's just, okay. So, really, both. When the Clone Wars season seven came out, yeah. right? Yeah. There were people, that whole conversation came up again about season one, season two. But yeah. And then Attack of the Clones, I think we're coming into the anniversary here. What next 20th year? anniversary. Uh, I think next we're right year? here. Oh, no, it's 2022. Not this yeah. year. It's going to be celebrated. Yeah. Yep. And there are people talking about it and like, like it was the most incredible story ever told. Um, it's the, it is the greatest love story ever told <laughs> and written. Yeah. But um, so I lost my train of thought. Oh, so yeah, just, just seeing Hayden Christensen have, uh, talk about how much a lot of this means to him and just be, it's just so eye opening for him because you got to figure a like a genuine he, guy. Yeah. And he it's left. That Canadian blood, man. Yeah. Super nice dude. But so to go back to Deborah Chow, I think there's a great quote in here. And again, I hate to just do quotes from the article, but I think it really, is important of how she viewed the Vader Kenobi or Anakin Kenobi dynamic. She, she says, I felt like it was quite hard to not include the person who left Kenobi in such anguish in the series. Uh, so what made have, so what intrigued her was the idea of despite Vader would become Kenobi still might care deeply. So quote again, I don't know how you could not, I don't think he will ever not care about him. Uh, co Kenobi to Anakin. What's special about their relationship is that they loved each other. Mm -hmm. You know, again, it's the, you start with an idea and you start with that relationship and you start with the connection 
And then the story sometimes just builds itself. You just start asking questions and this is how story meetings start, right? We, we've, if you've ever read behind the scenes or watched behind the scenes of uh, material in a writer's room. And I think High Republic has been really uh, good at documenting some of this stuff with the, with the writers. It's just a ton of questions. You start with something so basic and then you just start asking questions and all of a sudden you've got whiteboards full of information about what the character is feeling. Where are they at? How do they feel about this character? What, what is it they've been doing? What does this other one feel about this? And how do they all tie together? And, yeah, and so on and so forth. And so I like that Deborah Chow, the way that she's approaching this is very much from that perspective. Because again, if you don't hit the right notes on the emotional level with Anakin and Kenobi, or Vader and Kenobi, however you want to uh, view that, mm -hmm. it's not, it's going to fall flat. It's not going to work. And I, I agree with her. I think you have to have Vader in some way involved and for them not to, I, now I was on record as saying, I don't really need them to have a confrontation, but if you do it right, you can, you can really do something powerful with it. And it sounds like she has a fantastic idea about what to do and how that this, this, uh, conflict that we're going to see between the two of them is going to reshape our ideas, even all the way back to a new hope. Yeah. What, um, so there's another one in here, not to stir up anything, but I just kind of want to get us. So now that you've had a chance to kind of read the article, um, there was a line in there that said, she said, this is, I think it was Deborah Chow or somebody. I know it was, it was Anthony Breslikan. So to be clear, it wasn't anybody on the staff, but they said, technically you don't need Christensen for Vader. All you need is a mask, a hulking figure in a suit. And if you're lucky, James Earl Jones's imperious voice. Yeah. So what do you, do you read in, anything into that? Are they signaling that we're going to get James Earl Jones and not Hayden Christensen? And do you even care at this point? You know, it's funny. I had the same question for you, yeah. uh, but, Beat you to but, it. but it, it's, I mean, it's a, it's an obvious question though. I think it has no, I, I gotta be honest, but I don't think there's any basis behind it. I think you just cannot talk about Vader without talking about the voice because I, I to an extent he's right. And we've had this, we've had multiple people in the suit physically. Mm -hmm. you know, Dave Prowse, of course, was the original, but there's been a couple of others here and there. And so you can get away with some of that without really anyone knowing the better. I mean, we, we see it with Mandalorian a lot, right? We know that Pedro Pascal is not in the suit all the time, but does it take away from any of it? No, we probably don't even know who's in there half the time. Every once in a while you see a little bit body of difference. That's about it. Yeah. But for James Earl Jones, it's very... You know, that's a very important piece of it. But again, is it signaling one way or the other? I don't think so. I think it was a bit of baiting, you know, to dangle it out there just to get conversation going about what he's talking about. But I don't think that president has got any kind of insight on that one. I think he does. And I don't believe, <laughs> I think, I think I don't he, believe you. You're starting to sound like a separatist. Uh, I think he does. <laughs> and I think, uh, I think I'm it's neutral. Gonna, I think it's going to be James Earl Jones. I think they're going to do that. I think, but, they'll, I think they will. However, I, I have a feeling that either he, this is what we, I don't want to rehash what we talked about. Somehow mm -hmm. he, he takes the mask off or we have moments of flashbacks where he doesn't have to do that. Right. I think he's going to get his screen time and using his own voice and us getting to see the pain. And that was one of the, um, it wasn't in this interview, but it was in another recent uh, press tour interviews where he was talking about being able to convey the anger and pain that Anakin was feeling or Vader was feeling th throughout the series was something that he really enjoyed doing. You're not going to do that. I mean, you can, I mean, Pedro's now shown us that you can do that. You can do it behind a mask, but I do have a feeling we're going to see that. Uh, you need to his see face. a space in yep. some way, I some agree. way. Yeah. Okay. And again, it's going to be like Matt Lanter with, uh, you know, in rebels, oh, right. Mm -hmm. His voice came through when Ahsoka cracks his mask. Yep. And it was all the more powerful for just hearing his voice come through the right. modulator. Yeah. Maybe that's what happened though. In the fight, the modulator will break. And so we just hear break behind the mask the entire time. That'd be right. funny. Uh, okay. So let's move to Ahsoka next. Not a whole lot on Ahsoka, at least in maybe this interview. Maybe he'll tell Kenobi how afraid of senators he is. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's another callback. That's where his fear really stems from. <laughs> it's from, from politics. Yeah. Uh, okay. So for Ahsoka, uh, let's see. There was a, a there was an interesting bit that happened at the very beginning uh, in this interview. They're kind of talking about where uh, Rosario Dawson had kind of spoiled the or not spoiled because it's never been really confirmed, but she made an assumption that because Ahsoka was coming back, 
that Hayden Christensen would be back as well. And I think there was, this came out, you know, what is it? Three years ago now. There was some substantiated rumor online yeah. that she got faded into basically. <laughs> yeah. And she tweeted something like, Hey, fly boy or something. Hey, sky Where, guy. Sky you guy. Know, sorry. Fly see you boy. soon. Love snips or something snips. like that. Yep. And so they, this came all, this became a big thing. Um, but <laughs> what we, what we still don't know now, like, because it was brought up, and I get it. I get the interviews are being done because we're talking about all of these series. But now if, if for me, it's like resurfaced, like, okay, well, are they going to bring Vader back into the Ahsoka series? And would they do that? Um, it maybe is a flashback though, right? I mean, it would have to be, because at this point he's already passed on, but. Well, again, would it be Vader or Anakin? Exactly. Well, Anakin, because right. Again, no. Because again, if you're going to do it with Hayden. Yep. It should be Anakin in some way, right? Yeah, so but you're right. They were know. very, they were very open about this though, and like it was no big deal talking about it. It was more of a joke, which was a little bit surprising because I thought they would have perhaps spent less time talking about this type of thing. But yeah, um, they went through uh, this article. Really, I think what, at least for the Ahsoka piece, they were really just trying to refresh everyone that may not be familiar where with where Rebels ended and what Ahsoka truly, why she's truly after Thrawn. It was kind of a reset there. Now, in the extended one that happened at 3 p.m., there were a couple bit more, uh, bits that were ref, um, revealed. And I think primarily, <clears throat> and I don't, again, I don't want people to freak out because they kept, they were very clear about, look, we're just speculating. But they were really on going on about how uh, Filoni Wait, has- a, speculating? This is Anthony Bresnikan and uh, Adam Lance Garcia. <laughs> so- this is, why, this is why you can't trust journalists, though. Well, no, no, oh, time out. Whoa, whoa, hold, oh, on, hold on, hold on. You're Wait. about to step on something. He so Adam Adam Lance Garcia is legit. Okay. He is, uh, Anthony Bresnikan is legit but, too. However, I would say- speculating after writing an article about Star Wars of where they meet with people? In in this, you gotta listen to it. In this, okay. he even says, we shouldn't be doing this as journalists, but we're, we're being Star Wars fans right now. That's an so important they, piece of context. Okay. So they, they acknowledge that, yes, they were speculating. They were just having fun. Okay. But- the fact that they were what they were talking about was uh, they got on the subject of Heir to the Empire. And that's like Lance's like favorite series. I think he's around my age. so He grew up okay. with all that stuff. Right. But what he was what they were talking about was whether or not Filoni would try to wrap in some of that storyline. And they were alluding to, again, speculation. But we've talked about this, about whether or not because Thrawn's going to come back. Right. We know Thrawn's going to come back and there's going to be a long period of time there before we get to uh, sequel trilogy form proper where, you know, Kylo Ren, Snoke and all that. Right. Would they make an attempt at bringing something like heir to the empire? Would they bring that in? And all they don't really, he never says anything, but all he, all he does say is, or what they do agree on is that Filoni is known. He's a big fan of that series of books. And that is the story that we got from legends. And he is well known to bring back aspects of things in legends and retell them in different ways. And just to kind of uh, toot our own horns, we went into some of the speculation, I think, as part of the, uh, was it Bad Batch? I think we were talking about that. Yeah. Uh, so I don't want to, again, I'm not want to put too much into it, but that whole conversation is just very interesting to, to listen to. Uh, but beyond that, there really wasn't a whole lot uh, for this series. Uh, there was, I mean, it was kind of a rehash of everything that was already in the article. So, yeah. And we'll I see. think so to, to continue with that with Filoni, his quote in the article was, Ahsoka is a continuous story. Mm -hmm. And is driving towards a goal, in my mind, this is Filoni, as opposed to being a, a little, as opposed to being little singular adventures. Yeah. So that's what he wants the character to, to be doing. He knows that's what fans want too. And he recognizes that fans have a huge relationship. They've seen her grow from, you know, kid to adult now. And, you know, they're excited to see these characters continue. And his little comment at the very end is as they should be. So again, we know that Filoni always has a very, the, the traditional kind of George Lucas way of thinking is like, I know where this character is going more or less. And I got to figure out kind of how to get there, but I know where I want them to be and, and generally what's going to be around them. And so I think that's a really exciting thing about the characters that fly. And that's what we like most about Dave Filoni, right? Is that things matter, right? The little things matter sometimes and it, it, nothing seems to be wasted and it brings it all back together. So I think that's a, I think it's a lot of fun where Ahsoka can really, really appeal to a lot of different people at a lot of different age range too. Clone Wars, Rebels, and then the more recent fans that have seen her in Mandalorian. So yeah. a lot of, I mean, a lot of opportunity there with Ahsoka. Yeah. And if you bring Vader in, I mean, now you're appealing to a whole, you know, another group you know, in particular. So 
Um, Very cool. Jeff says, Jonesy is kind of right. You got to keep articles and columns separate. Articles should be straightforward. Columns, obviously, editorialize, editorialize away. Uh, so the con- so I didn't I don't think I've said this, but what this was was a Twitter conversation. So in in Twitter, you can have one of these like it's almost like a going live on YouTube, but it's Twitter, and anybody can join, and it's just people talking. And it's like a chat room, basically, or you think of it like a Discord audio chat room. It's essentially it's exactly what it is, but just through Twitter. And that's what they were doing was, hey, now that we've written these articles, let's get together and just kind of talk about and tease some other stuff up in as well. So they did get into speculating things and they and all that, but it was not a, here's another the, article. That's the blurring of the line though, right? Hey, we've written this article. Let's speculate on all the things that I've learned from it after talking and spending time with these people. I think that's where the line gets blurred a little bit. I It's a, to do them in the, to, to advertise one in the same breath of saying, let's do, we're also going to do this later and have a town hall type of thing. It's just, it's blurry. And so it, it just, I don't know. It's my preference. I would, I would say, I, I like to, I like to have lines that are a bit more clear maybe, but yeah. Uh, I would say, listen to it and then see if you have the same opinion. That's all. I think my uh, general I, opinion would be the same. How he does it though. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not disputing what you're saying at all that they, you know, how they presented and things like that may have been clear, but it's just on the surface. If you're not, if you don't have all of that with it, you could definitely take some wrong conclusions from it pretty quickly. Yeah. Anyway, I'll uh, stop beating the horse. Uh, let's talk about Andor. I'm very confrontational in the night. Jeez. Uh, Andor, there was some new stuff in here. Um, I mean, well, I wouldn't say new, probably more. I was probably just fleshed out a little bit more. Like we know, like, the refugee story that we suspected was there because of the quote that was given in Rogue One about yeah. some of us have been in this fight since we were you know, five years old, seven years old, whatever it was. Although uh, we get a little bit of context to that comment now, but I'm curious how accurate it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, he's a he's a refugee. Um, there, you know, his family is they're fleeing this the the power of the empire. Yeah. Uh, Journey so, of a migrant is how uh, how Luna called it. Yeah. Yep. Um, so yeah, um, it, what. And this one, I won't get personal. This one struck me kind of hard because it, it, the rest of that quote says that feeling of having to move is behind this story very profoundly and very strong that shapes you as a person. It defines you in many ways and what you are willing to do. Uh, and again, I don't want to get too personal, but this is like what I went through as a migrant worker. My families were migrant workers and we would constantly be moving back and forth between Michigan and Texas and I always talk, I used to talk about how that really was, it defined me in a lot of different ways because I never lived any one place and, uh, you know, school's over and I'd go work. Um, and, and it was just, it really, it, it, I think it, that's why I'm so, that I, you, of all the series, I've been on the same, I've been very consistent. Like the one I want to see the most is Andor um, because I'm, ever since that line was said, like, I don't know. It just resonated with me. And the fact that it's Diego Luna and then because of my heritage and all that, of course, there's that's something to be said too. I love the fact, and I'm going to just say it because um, I, I said this uh, recently and someone's kind of giving me a bunch of crap for it, but I don't think people do truly appreciate what it's like to be able to see characters in Star Wars that look like you. I know that sounds, it shouldn't be about that, but at the end of the day, it really is. And for me growing up, I didn't have that. I really didn't have any characters like that. Um, even to this day, some of these, a lot of these series, Kids don't have uh, those characters to look up to. And so when Cassie and Andor came out, having a Mexican heritage person up there in Star Wars was a huge effing deal for me. Like, I, you, I can't even I can't even put words uh, to what that meant for me, but more importantly, what it means for other kids, because I know, again, as I was looking up at those screens and going, well, these people, none of these people look like me. I was still I still love the stories. It didn't make me love them any less. But I think when you do right. that, you get people to love them any, any, or even more. Uh, and him being this refugee and, and on the run and not being settled in and, you know, the, the, the power machine that is the empire, all that stuff, I think just is going to play into a really great series. So, yeah, it's sad um, to say, it's sad to hear that you got crap for that online, because I think it's one of those things. If, if you've, if you've grown up not having to have that thought, I mean, you're, you're pretty fortunate. <laughs> to to feel like you're you're just so engaged and entwined with everything that you see and everything feels like you are, mm-hmm. you know that that certain amount of of privilege, if you will, you know, to not have that and, and be feel like you're deprived of that in some way, you know, you're you're missing, maybe not deprived, but you're missing some of yeah. those, and then to get crap for that's really disappointing. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people that feel that way because they 
can't refuse to understand what that means. Yeah. So I, yeah, I'm with you. Over. This is a story though. And, or this is actually, even though it was pretty brief, this article did a lot to get me excited about this series though. And I mean, the destruction of Andor's home world, kind of curious what that actually means. It does sound like it's an actual destruction of sorts. So yep. is that, is that something maybe an early Kyber crystal testing or something to that extent, you know, but also the, like you were saying, the expansion of the empire, the radicalization of the world that he adopted at his home, which I think we can all, you know, to some extent appreciate as well, right? As, as our politics have gotten more extreme and as our behaviors have drifted outwards rather than inwards, you know, we, we can see a lot of some of the story maybe, you know, being reflective in our own culture as well, which I was, I think is going to be interesting. And I was also really interested in seeing that Mon Mothma is going to have a bit more of a focus in the story too. Yeah. A, a silent background character that has been so instrumental in the lore aspect of it, but has yet to really get that moment to shine in canon, uh, really, yeah, really just in the canon you know, space of it all. So I'm glad that they're working that into it and that they're very much intertwined in Andor's story along with Mon Mothma's, uh, Mon Mothma's uh, you know, influence and, and uh, her perspective on things. Yep. I, there was, I don't know where I had this. It was in the notes, but I think it was, um, they were talking about how their stories were going to run in parallel. Um, yeah. So, so seeing, you know, Mothma, what she's going through and then seeing a completely different take on it, um, through the eyes of, uh, Cassie and Andor is kind of how I took that. But I think the interesting question, so the theme of the series is devotion that was announced. I think it mentioned in the article, but then the question that Gilroy, um, I think he's the, what writer director, I forget what his name. Uh, yeah. Tony Gilroy. Yeah. Uh, but he, he posed that question of who sacrifices their life for a galaxy, right? Like how big is that cause that you would sacrifice your life for an entire galaxy, right? Or to, at least to block, and again, to take the words from the article, to block the, the goals of the empire is kind of what he's ultimately doing here. And uh, you think of characters like Saul Guerrero. Um, I think there was, if there was not mentioned in this one, it was in the other one. Uh, but they, I guess, confirmed that we were going to have a Saul Guerrero in the, uh, what are they called? Not the pacifist, but the, um, oh, I'm trying to think of the names. I forget the name right now. But they've got a, the, the name for their, their movement, right? That'll be a part of it as well. So seeing that, I mean, because that was what those guys were doing. They were putting their lives on the lines. For, all of them were uh, for the galaxy. So, yeah, I mean, and there's clearly a backstory with Bon Mothma and them too. So that they would all be intertwining a bit is, makes sense. Yeah. I think the other thing that Gilroy was also saying is that, you know, how do you take Andor, you know, how do you end up where he is in Rogue One where you're willing to give your life for the galaxy in a, in a moment with people you barely know when you come from this very risk averse and this, uh, they called it revolution averse and cynical type of, you know, perspective, a character who's very lost and really probably just mad at the galaxy, right? It just doesn't want anything to do with it and certainly doesn't want to get involved. That sounds yeah. familiar, but you know, so, so how do you get from that point to, you know, to the point where it is in Rogue One? I think that's a really interesting story. And I said, you know, season one is really going to focus on that part of Andor is these first steps of him changing that perspective of wanting nothing to do with any of this stuff to where we start to see him headed in later material. Yep. Uh, let's see. I don't think I had anything else. Um, on that one uh they did say see they mentioned season the first season so i think we talked about that as yeah. it was potentially three seasons long um yeah, as many as five it sounds like it's been dialed back to three that's all speculative i believe but yep three but seasons was, is still at least long, two still a lot for star wars yeah there's still at least two yeah and I, I think when we get to the end of the show we'll we'll outline the timeline as we see it uh, for all the shows i know we've not really said when they're all releasing but we'll, we'll give you the timeline from start to finish about what we can expect for the next 12 to 15 months. Oh, did you, did you put that together? Right here, baby. Oh, okay. Because okay. I was like, oh, I didn't, no, I do have, I, do I that, do have notes but, uh, for it. No, okay. I do have notes for it though. And we'll have to speculate a, a little bit about one that sure. was not talked about that fits in there somewhere. So, yeah. but yeah. Okay. So, uh, let's move into, I guess the second to last that I've got here, which is the Alkalite. Yeah. The Alkalite That's a, yeah. Again, not a whole lot new in this one, but, but anything is more than what we've had. True, we've had basically zilch, <laughs> but again, yeah, Leslie Headland is uh, is the person. Uh, she's the showrunner for this one, 
And so it was really cool to have her reference a really, you know, cement where we're at in the timeline, which I think we already knew anyway, but again, reaffirm that because it's been a while since we've said anything about Acolyte. Mm -hmm. So this is about a hundred years before Phantom Menace. So about 50 years or so after where we're at in the High Republic timeline, but still very much High Republic. So she has been spending a lot of time immersing herself in the High Republic. Very convenient timing there. Uh, but some of the interesting parts though, is that, yeah, so they're in the casting phase of, on the movie side or the, the show size. And they're in the casting phase, but the writing is basically done. So those are all positive things. Uh, and some of the you know, questions that she's been asking is, you know, how did they get to this point? You know, how do you get to the point where a Sith Lord could basically, you know, get behind the scenes in the Senate and start to take control when you're in this, uh, really this, this environment where the Jedi, I think she used, uh, you know, monk-like figures that are in these pristine white and gold and nothing, you know, they don't get dirty. They have no conflict. So how do you go from this type of world to what we end up getting in the, in the prequel and original trilogies? And it sounds like she's very much going to zero right into that, which I think is really going to spark a lot of people's interests. So uh, I'm, I hate, like you said, I hate to just read this, but I think it's important. Uh, in the article, it said uh, Leslie Helan describes the Acolyte as a mystery thriller, hmm. mystery yeah, thriller a, set in a prosperous and seemingly peaceful era when the galaxy is still sleek and glistening. We actually use the term Renaissance or the Age of Enlightenment, she says. Uh, Jedis were not always ascetic, monk-like figures looking selfishly and brave, or uh, were living selfishly and bravely. Self Jedi uniforms, selflessly. Yeah, selflessly. Living selflessly and bravely, yeah. A very interesting comment there. <laughs> the Jedi uniforms are gold and white, et cetera, because they would never be, uh, okay, yeah. So the point of this was, um, uh, in the, in the post-review, post-Twitter thing that they did, uh, he mentions that, the timeline is probably closer to the fall of the Jedi than it is the the old the end of the old Republic or the High Republic. Okay. So either way, um, I I think it's going to I think we're still going to get the same kind of feel. I think it's still going to feel like the High Republic, uh, but there may be things in place where um, you know we're going to start seeing the inklings of things going wrong. There was uh, let me pull this up because there was something they said. So do you, well, while you're doing that, let me ask you a yeah, question. No, no, so, do you think this is going to span? Maybe it starts a hundred years, but then there's a big jump forward in time, say fifty years. Are you getting that impression from it that there might be something that starts, but it's more like a a, a prologue of sorts, right? Kind of like we were talking about during the Patreon show of you have this lead-in material to a movie, you know, before the uh -huh. credits start, right? It, are you getting the feeling it might be something like that? Because, I mean, she specifically said about 100 years. That doesn't mean that it all takes place right there. And if they're suggesting otherwise, that's uh, an interesting comment to make. Yeah, I didn't. If they're just speculating. I didn't get the sense that that was what they were talking about. I, I got the sense that it was going to be 100 years and there'd be no jump. I don't. We don't know how long the series okay. is going to be either, too. So if it's eight ser uh, episodes, you know, and done, then right. that's probably not going to. That probably won't work. Um, I can't forget. So let me, I'll just kind of summarize what stood out to me in that post one was they were talking about how uh, somebody is going to rise in somebody's, someone is going to infiltrate the ranks of the higher up echelon, ep, uh, echelon, right? Echelon. Yeah. Echelon. Thank you. Uh, the higher echelons. And so I don't know of, exactly. Of well, like the Senate or the Jedi? I don't, that's probably, I don't know if oh. they meant the Jedi or the Senate, to be honest. Okay. Um, and I don't know if they were talking as like, you know, Palpatine and, and getting, maybe they were referencing Palpatine and that was like, how did we get there? You know? Um, but I, if they're going to do 50 years back, Palpatine's going to be pretty young if he's, if, depending on where this lands. Um, yeah. and on top of that, I, I, so I suspect that we're going to get a plague of story. I mean, I guess that's where I, what, my talking point on this was, it felt like we're probably going to get this plague of story. Um, and maybe we get the reference of, you know, that, that whole, we're going to, they're going to recontextualize much like they did in episode four with the, the whole speech between Vader and Kenobi before their final fight. Maybe that throne room, not throne room, but the, uh, opera scene is going to be, you know, recontextualized and we get some background into that as well. So. Right. And who's the, it's a uh, Amanda Stenberg. Yeah. Is I think the, she's the only one that's reported, been reported as reportedly the only one who's been, been officially cast. cast in it. Yep. I know nothing about her either. I've not even looked to see how old she is. 
uh, what she's done in the past. But um, I think one other interesting thing that, that, that the showrunner said was that, you know, the political and the personal and the spiritual things, you know, that come up in this tire time period are things that we just don't know a lot about, which I think is we're getting a much better idea with high Republic. But again, where is it evolving as you get in something closer to the prequel trilogy? You know, how is that dynamic changing? Especially when you start talking about the spiritual side of things, because the, you know, the hubris that we see the Jedi council have by the time Phantom Menace comes around and the type of hubris we see in the high Republic are quite different. So where is it going from that? And how much do the events that we're seeing in high Republic so far really play into that. And then I think furthermore, what's phase three actually going to look like. Yeah. This will uh, presumably be coming out around the time phase three would be starting. Potentially. I think we, we did mention that too. We were kind of thinking it would be, I said it was going to be predicated on that. Cause I don't see how they're going to be able to tell it get messy. I think if they were still in a phase two and trying to tell a story. Um, but what do I know? Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. I think, uh, it, again, it kind of depends on what stories they are. And yeah. Exactly how far apart they are, too. I think I think you could do it if you were in phase... If you did them simultaneously, you could probably still get away with it and make it work. Yeah. Um, I don't, these right. guys are creative. That's why they make the big bucks. Ish. Ish. All right. Okay, let's talk about uh, Grammar really Radio. No, man, no, really, yeah, no real Mando news, by the way. Just a no. confirmation on the time, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Yeah, I think, yeah. We'll yeah, that, so but... Grammar Rodeo, what what the heck is this thing? <laughs> so Gra Grammar Rodeo um, is just the name. That's like it's a code name, right? Like yeah, it's a Simpsons Blue Harvest. Episode. Yeah, it's a Simpsons reference, right? Yes. There's an episode of Gra uh, Simpsons called Grammar Rodeo where Bart and some kids, I think they take a car and they uh, say they're going to go to the Grammar Rodeo. And I don't know. I've, I've never seen the episode, to be honest. But um, the point. So this story, uh, I guess what was confirmed, all we know now is that there's at least four kids. Uh, they had a casting call for kids around the ages of 10 to 12. Um, it is set during post there's it's set post return of the Jedi and during the Mandalorian era. Okay. Um, on top of that, they uh, it's in the vein of what they call the Amblin movies of the eighties, which is really code oh, for God. the Steven Spielberg type movies of the eighties. Right. So you think Caravan about like, courage. A, no, that's not, that's not one of them. <laughs> No, this is like uh, like Goonies. Um, or st think of like Goonies, uh, Stand by Me. Um, you know, even ET. You know, with the way the boys interacted, or or more recently, uh, Stranger Things, which is really yeah, kind of that like as well. Things. Yeah, right. That's a retelling of those same stories. It's that coming of age story of these kids in a in an era where they have they have to make choices that have really significant and dire consequences, and you know they're probably tasked and they're going to save the galaxy in some way, even though you know they may not know it initially. Uh, but yeah, young kids on adventure, high stakes. Uh, the story is told through the eyes of these kids as well. But beyond that, there's not a whole lot. But it does sound like, I mean, when they're talking about all these different series like that, it sounds like it's going to be before any, you know, Rangers series or whatever else has been tossed out there um, for the future. So I don't know. I, I don't know when this one falls in. Um, my gut tells me it'll probably, if they're only at this phase now, it's maybe it's not till next year before they start filming. All right. So probably two years out at least on it. Yeah, the cool thing is the one, the thing that I'm speculating on that I'm really on board with is I hope that we get a Kylo Ren series. Like we get a, that Kylo Ren is one of these four kids. I'd like for it to be Jedi. It, uh, it doesn't have to be, but if these are four kids as part of Luke's temple and he's training them and one of them just happens to be Kylo Ren, and we get to see these young adventures of Kylo Ren, or ben, ben Solo, Solo sorry. Right. Young adventures of Ben Solo along with his buddies. Maybe they bring some of the characters that we saw in the in the comic book, like his best friend that, um, well, like his only friend, really. But, uh, you know, that would be a, that'd be an interesting thing to see. And I think it would paint his character in a different way and we'd get to see him again. It doesn't have to be, like I said, it could be, you know, any four kids that have, that don't even have, that are not uh, force sensitive. Maybe that's the story they want to tell, but. So are you getting a, are you getting an impression that this is an actual children's younger viewer type of series or is this now this is going to be kind of traditional star wars ish you know age age ranges pg yeah. 13 type thing I, yeah, I think it's all been speculated I, i've seen people speculate that it is and that it isn't so no one knows okay. i don't think anyone knows for sure um right. casting kids 
your automatic assumption is that, oh, it's going to be for younger viewers, but Stranger Things clearly is not that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Certainly not for, yeah, not for the really young. Um, so, yeah, I'm excited about this one. Um, they had me when they said Amblin 80s. I mean. Right. Uh, that's all you needed. That's all I needed, right? So. Like you just, you had the logo pop in your head and you were good <laughs> right. to go, right? Ready to go. Uh, let's see. Okay. And then lastly, uh, let's talk about the future of Star Wars. Um, there was, there's some good points in here. Like she talked about the, the era, the 60 years era and, and wanting them to get out of that era. Like, I think they're, they're acknowledging like, okay, we've, we've, we've done enough here and we need to move on. Like, where does the future of Star Wars lie? Uh, they mentioned the Alkalite. So that's going back. I mean, we've heard rumors. I mean, we, you know, we've got uh, Tales of the Jedi, whatever that is going right. to be announced officially, or we'll get to maybe see something or know more about it here at Celebration. So there's that. Um, but, you know, the big open, wide open space for them really is going to be post the rise of Skywalker. And, um, you know, rumors were that Taika Waititi's was going to be either in that era or in the you know, old Republic era, I think is what we've seen so far. So what do you, I mean, we keep saying like, I was, I was done when Rogue One came out. Like, okay, I don't need any more stories from then yet. I'm pretty happy with everything that's come out. Right. Do you think they're, they're going to keep going to the well, or do you think they're eventually going to finally just break away from it? I mean, it's really hard to say that they're not going to, because everything they've built is right in the core of the well, <laughs> yeah, right? Right, right. I mean, that's really where they keep fleshing things out even more and more. But you're right. I mean, at some point they've got to break away. And I think Acolyte will be a very good first opportunity to start to see how that works. I think the response to High Republic has been... I think overwhelmingly positive in most regards. I think there's some pockets, but that don't like it, but whatever, we don't acknowledge those people, <laughs> but you know, uh, but I think, I think it's probably more in the past than it is the future because when you go to the future, you have to start answering certain questions like, okay, well, is the Skywalker saga, is the Skywalker lineage still alive? And you start going down those routes. Now I'm not saying you have to go to the Skywalkers right away, but if you're going to the future, that's probably the first thing you're thinking about, right? Yeah. Like, okay, well, what happened to Ray? You know, what happened to Poe? What happened to Finn? You know, what 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 did Lando and and Xana go find? You know, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of those types of questions where if you go in the past, you can do really good things with characters that you already have some amount, like the uh, you know Legends characters. Mm -hmm. But you could also turn those into different stories that fit the overall narrative of what we want to tell now and really, you know, officially build those characters out. So I think where it's probably going into the past, it's probably not what they would prefer to do. I think if they had, if they just had a, you know, just a, a, you know, a free drop on this type of thing. But honestly, I think it's probably the, the right mix of safe enough, but enough freedom that you can do whatever you want, because really they could go in the old Republic and the old Republic is thousands of years. Oh, so, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. a huge playground. Right. So wherever you want to go, you don't have to touch any of the characters if you don't want to that are established. And you just kind of create your own, you know, your own little, you know, pocket there for a hundred years. And you kind of, and that's, that's kind of what we thought things were going to go anyway. We thought there was going to be a, basically a new trilogy, if you will. And I was actually glad that, you know, Kathleen Kennedy cleared some of that up. And we think of these in trilogies, but they're really serials, right? And we need to stop thinking about them and, and, and groupings of things and really more of this uh, continuous storytelling, the persistent storytelling, I think is what she called it. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, but that's what we originally speculated is that, you know, well, Old Republic, we'd have a, you know, a series or a set of movies, you know, back in that time frame. So I think it was probably going in the past. I think going in the future is a bit sketchy. And then you have to kind of reimagine what Star Wars looks like a hundred years, a thousand years into the future. And then you start looking at E-Man and that didn't go well. <laughs> The new, he, new Adventures of He-Man was, yeah, that did not work. Yeah, hit a, hit a soft spot for you there. Or a hard yeah, I did. I, I took myself there. It's like punching myself in the leg or something. Yeah, in the nuts. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's so I think, line, my... <laughs> Yeah, she said, uh, we have a roadmap. Um, yeah. I, I believe her. I, I just, like you said, it, I think it's a little, it's probably sketchy right now at best because I think movies are just so far out still for them. It's probably the very beginning of the roadmap. I don't think they've mapped out you know, the next 12 years or anything like that. Right. Disney, but I think, I think, oh. but a, I think a roadmap in general is important to have. Here are the ideas we have, and here's the ones we think we want to carry forward, and here's how they're kind of connected, and here are the lines that we have, and here's where we want to see those go. And right? I think it's 
there's not always a it's not always a straight path. You're not you're not you're not doing it on an old you know atlas or anything like that. You're not sticking pens in the in the wall. But I think in general, you you at least have an idea of what you have and what you want, mm-hmm. and you start filling in the gaps as you go. As long as you've generally got the you know have a general direction you're wanting to wanting to head. Um, I want to address something in the in the comments real quick. Uh, Dale says, "Do you think it makes sense to calculate time from a different point? It wouldn't make too much sense to p- that people were always calculating down to something that would likely uh, wouldn't likely be predicted." In different sh- stories, a thousand BBY is only known as a thousand BBY after BBY. Yes, and you're right. So, like when you get to the um, when we get to uh, what do you call it, the sequel trilogy. The time, the way time is kept is, is changed galactic wide. It's no longer references BBY. It's before the, what is it? Hosnian Prime. Yeah, after, or whatever after, they call it. It was Hos, whatever happened on Hosnian Prime, that becomes a milestone. And something incident. Yeah. After the Hosnian incident or something. I forgot yeah. what the abbreviation was. Now in Legends for the longest time, they did use BBY, but this was, a, I guess, I would say a more recent change, but it was later on um, that they started putting these different milestones in place. I think in the, what was it? In the High Republic, they use um, the uh, Great Disaster is kind of their milestone for the time yeah. setting then. Uh, but this really came about because I think of all people, it was Pablo Hidalgo who came out and said that yeah. the time that they were going to start changing that because of this point, like it's not relevant to these people because it either hasn't happened yet or they're marking their time based on something else. Um, so Short, short answer is, yeah, you're right. It it just depends on what era we're talking about was that people Scott, market. Starkiller incident, maybe? Before and after Starkiller incident? BSI? ASI? I thought yeah, it had Hosnian Prime. Prime. And, go look it up. I'm pretty sure it had Hosnian Prime. Um, okay, so uh, the rest of the movies here, uh, we talked about Taika Waititi's movie coming out first. Uh, they mentioned Rogue Squadron, and they said further off. I Man... I swear, anything for it clicks. Is, it is ASI and BSI. Is it? Yeah. What's first, ASI? After, after Star, Star Killer? Killer incident. I I, rec- I I googled it. The very first thing came up. ASI and BSI are dumb. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> yeah. There we the go. positivity of the internet shining, <laughs> yeah. shining through. Thanks, Star Wars fans. Um, there's uh, so Rogue Squadron was listed as being uh, further off, not canceled. You're, there's so many clickbait articles already on this one, and we're going to talk about Ryan Johnson here in a second. Uh, and then yeah. the Kevin, yeah, the Kevin uh, Feige movie. This one has, was interesting, yeah. Yeah, There's nothing to it. Basically. Yeah, I mean, they in the, in the post one too. This came up, and they were talking about. They confirmed twice it is just rumored. There, they everyone loves to see, would love to see what he's got to do, but it, there's nothing official down. And so, going back to what we said earlier, I don't think they're going to put their name down as saying there's a Kevin Feige production or he's behind anything until he's like, yeah, I've got the story, I'm committed. And I'm ready to do this. Until then, it's just going to be a rumor. So right. I, I wouldn't get all spun up about that, about whether or not we're going to go down the Marvel path or, you know, Feige's coming in, what that's going to do or change. Feige's pretty busy. Yeah, he's got a lot on his plate right now. Oh, uh, the Ryan Johnson I, trilogy. Joe, yeah. Oh, my goodness. So Backburnered. Yeah, backburner was the term that was uh, used. Um I'm trying to remember now if it was Kathleen Kennedy or if that yes. was Anthony Bresnikan that said that. But uh, either way, that may have been him. Yeah, I think it might have been Bresnikan. Did this, uh, did this come up in the in the after? Yeah, it does in the town hall thing. They don't they don't spend a whole lot of time on it, but they do talk about it. Um, the notes that I put was um, uh, they don't want to make an official announcement uh, because on, uh, on the details until they can get the director lined up, and so. Ryan Johnson is in that same book. He's got, he's got some crazy Netflix deal that I didn't know he had done. Yeah. Um, he's got uh, Knives Out 2 that he's working on, right? And they're, now they're even talking there could be a possible part three Sounds on that. Sounds like there's going to be a yeah, three-movie deal on that one. Um, but uh, for him, he, he's, he's, as well as Kathleen Kennedy, have said, look, I, I, the only thing they ever did is said, hey, do you want to do a series of movies in Star Wars? And he said, yeah, hell yeah, I want to do that. And that's it. It never went any further. They never got anything in writing. There was a lot of speculation, at least you know, on our part and everyone else's part about what this well, meant. Yeah. I mean, then again, she did come out and say it too, but yeah. yeah. So it's something they Another talked about. Learned. <laughs> exactly. This is one of those things where she was, like I said, this is eye opening. Like they're not going to sit there and say, we've got it coming. They've talked to him. It is a, and, that, and that's it. They've got an idea. It sounds like he's got an open door to come in and do this when he's ready. But 
you know, it's not canceled and it's not in production. It's not active either. So I don't know what that is. It's just kind of an idea at this point. Yeah. I think something so. else that was not mentioned here that was surprising is that Michael Waldron has, it came out just in the last few days saying that he is actively writing something for Star Wars, a film. And it was not referenced in this article at all. And so I don't know if it's, I don't know if he's working with the, on the Taika Waititi film or what, but another writer, I forgot who they put in there, but there was a different writer that was put in here that was you know, writing something, but not Michael Waldron, which was a little surprising. So I didn't know if there was anything to read into that. I'm assuming it was just overlooked or just not part of that conversation, but mm. yeah. I have mixed feelings about Waldron now. Like I, he's done some pretty good work. Um, I think I think he did two of the characters in Strange a little dirty, in my opinion. Um, and if somebody wants to know what my Marvel opinion is on that, I'm happy to talk to him about it. But uh, I don't know. Didn't it, that movie kind of rubbed me the wrong way? In some in some regards, I loved it. Uh, I thought it was awesome, but I don't know. I didn't really like the way they took some of the characters. But that's ne neither here nor there. So all I, all I'm saying is I'm I wouldn't say I'm skeptical, but I'm worried about what they stick him with because he he feels like another. Um, uh, what's the guy that, that, that did, uh, the rise of Skywalker? <sighs> it doesn't matter. Um, so we'll see. We'll see. I, he could crank out something amazing. We'll, we, you never know. So I think a quote that, that was in this article and maybe a good kind of wrap up about this kind of section, these, these types of shows that we're talking about movies, but it was Michelle, uh, Rejwan, who's an executive producer on Obi-Wan and one of the lead development chiefs, uh, she said that it's fun to, in your head, peruse the Star Wars toy store. We've talked about this a lot. Uh, mm. Oh, you can have this character or feature that ship. But at the end of the day, we really need to keep it pure about why. So whenever, and I think this is something that, that came up in the article a few times, and maybe it came up in the town hall too, but is when you want to bring a character in or you want to write a story about someone or you want to use this or that, there should be a reason why it's there. And it shouldn't just be, we're throwing everything in it. So we, we give, we had a little bit of fun with Favreau that, you know, he's having fun with his action figures and whatnot, but so far each one has had a, had a bit of a reason of why they were there. And it was probably very clear that he could explain to you exactly why that character was there. And so I think this is, again, this calls to the attention that they want to pay to the story. And when a writer comes in and say they want to do something, that is not just throwing things out there to appease someone or to do fan service. It's like, okay, no, we really want to have a reason why this is in there. Sometimes it's because it's fun. It doesn't have an impact, but if you're going to do something major, you really do need to have a reason why. And you have to have a very clear description as to why that is because you know, you're going to have to answer for it at some point. Yeah. Um, do you, uh, so before you run through the timeline, I just, there was one other thing I had in my notes here. Uh, so looking ahead, what do we, so there's seven articles that are coming out from Vanity Fair as part of this ongoing coverage of the uh, rebellion will be televised. So tomorrow, uh, it sounds like he, it sounds like he was going to have to make a decision about which ones, he, what order he was going to release these in. But it does sound like tomorrow, because of all the feedback today and the conversations that we're spinning up and people taking things out of context, right or wrong, right on his part, um, there, I think he's going to hit, he's going to do the longer Q&A with Kathleen Kennedy tomorrow. Um, and so it'll sense. be, uh, yeah. And then I don't know the order of these, uh, but there's going to be one with John Favreau talking about ex explicitly talking about the book of Boba Fett, uh, giving us background and how that came about, um, why he made the decisions he made on some of these things. I don't know how different that's going to be from the behind the scenes stuff that's recently come out, but I would expect if they're going to do an article, there's probably more into it, um, which, which would be fine. Um, then. Here's a really interesting one. So Leslie Hedlin is going to be, he's got a one-on-one -on -one interview exclusively about the Alkalite, excuse me, and to quote his terms, what to expect with that show. So oh, it's, awesome. it'll probably be a further expansion on what we got today. I don't know if they're going to have a whole lot more details. We'll have to see. But I mean, we're getting pretty close to celebration. So I don't think it's far. I don't think it's a stretch to say he, he wouldn't give some good stuff here. Can I ask a silly question, Albert? Yeah. So why are we not having these discussions at celebration and we're doing them on an article? I think they're working people up, honestly. I think they're like, I think this is like the pep rally, right? But is Acolyte, is it, I'm trying to remember the, the panel schedule. I don't remember Acolyte really playing into any of it. 
I mean, it's going to be, if it's, if, there, if there's no alkalite specific one, I would say alkalite. I keep saying alkalite, alkalite. If there's anything, um, it's probably in that one hour, an hour and a half show that we're up against on the first opening day of Star Wars on film or Star Wars. What was the name of it? That's the Lucasfilm showcase. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe there's, there's bits and pieces in there. Oh, That's I got, an hour and a half. I got long, even worse. Though. No, I got even worse news for us on that one too. Oh, what when happened? I through the, when I go through the timeline, I'll tell you. Oh, wonderful. Speculation, speculation, not true okay. or not confirmed. All right. But uh, definitely uh, more on the Acolyte coming with uh, Leslie Heedland. Um, there's an article that's specifically around or with Rosario Dawson and on the Ahsoka series. So we'll get more on Ahsoka specifically. Um, there is one for Diego Luna and Tony Gilroy together talking about Cassie and Andor. And then I think he's going to end it. He said on a funny, upbeat note. I don't know if the other ones are sad, but uh, Pedro Pascal talking about his experience with Star Wars, how he was brought into the universe and what his life is like now. So um, those are the seven. So you got every day between now and what, right up leading directly up until uh, Celebration, we'll have a new article coming out from uh, Vanity like Fair. But then this is what he did with Entertainment Weekly, right? He had those lead yeah. up articles every he did single the day. Same thing. Yeah. But, all right. Give us a timeline. What are you thinking here? Okay. So we, know got, so we know we've got Kenobi coming up next week, right? So that's, okay. that's number one. Now they told us that Andor is releasing late summer of this year. So that's number two. This is where it leads into my comment for just a minute ago about celebration is during that show, that Lucasfilm showcase. It wouldn't surprise me if we didn't a, at least get a sizzle reel, if not some sort of teaser for Andor during mm. that time. Yeah. But come see our show, please. Yeah, come see us. That stuff's not important. You can always look at the internet later. Yeah, Unless it's exactly. a sizzle reel, then you have to wait a year until you get it from the investors. But I'm not bitter about that. Uh, now, one thing that was not mentioned in any of this stuff is Bad Batch 2. And it is unclear where Bad Batch is coming in. But if Mandalorian Season 3 is not now until late 2022 or early 2023, that seems to suggest that Bad Batch 2 would likely be out sometime in the fall. So that's my mm. guess. So we got Kenobi okay. and or another few months and then we get Bad Batch Then we get into Mandalorian season three and then we get a little bit more lack of clarity with or a little less clarity rather with when Ahsoka will drop in 2023. Uh, it sounds like if they're just now filming, how much time do you need for that? A year, 15 months, something Depends like that? Depends on the episodes, I guess. Yeah. So that could be reasonable that, you know, by this time next year, Ahsoka could be getting ready to spin into, you know, actual release. So that would again be another few months after a Mandalorian. It would make sense for those two maybe to tie in directly together. And then again, and then it becomes a bit of a, the wild West, right? We know we potentially have a movie at the end of 2023, the first official movie, 2023, 2025 and 2027. Unclear exactly how those will shake out. And then when does Acolyte actually fit in somewhere that sounds a little less clear, but my guess is probably closer to the end of 2023 at the earliest. If they're still casting, mm. that kind of means that production might not start on that one until fall or maybe towards the end of this year. Guess I think, fall. yeah, no, that's a, you, that's some good work. I mean, I, I think this will all, hopefully we'll get some of this firmed up at celebration. Um, I think so. I think we'll get a bad batch confirmation without fail. Is, isn't there a panel for that? Yes. There's an okay. actual, yeah, there's a, uh, on the stage, it's one of the right. things you have to sign up for on Sunday, I believe. Sunday. Okay. okay. Yeah. Oh boy. So anyway, that's kind of the quick rundown of what to expect for all of the major television and theatrical stuff. Juan says, geez, we'll be in our fifties by then. Yeah. <laughs> Some of us will. <laughs> oh, it's a little bit closer than others. Yeah. 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 Oh boy. Um, all right. All so, right. Do you, uh, few shout outs and a few plugs how about that all right so uh, so for those listening we do a well thank you for listening first of all but we do a live stream on tuesdays and thursdays we will eventually get to jedi hunters the inquisitors we do promise at some point <laughs> if things would stop coming up uh but yeah we would like love for you to come out and join us we're on youtube and most of the other social media even our patreon we do live stream live so please come find us cantinacast.com slash events if you'd like to see what shows are coming up. We usually have at least a couple of posted out there of the next few. 
tonight we had Ken, Steph, Jonathan, Tuan, Lauren, JW, Qui-Gon J, Dale. If I missed someone else, I apologize, but thank you guys so much for all of the, really a lot of activity in the chat lately, which has been a lot of fun. Uh, I think Kathy was in there as well. Thank you, Kathy. And we saw uh, more people lurking around in the background too. So again, thank you guys for uh, paying attention. Uh, Richard Williams gave us a thumbs up there on Facebook as well. So thank you, Richard. And uh, yeah, so katinacast.com slash events. If you're going to be at Celebration, you have two things you need to go do. One is to come see us on the podcast stage, which is on Thursday at 11 o'clock in the morning, local time in California. And we'll be in the podcast stage, which is right in the middle of the complex. We got a map uh, yesterday, so that's kind of nice. <laughs> and then also, if you are not busy going into the parks Friday night, uh, we're going to be hosting an event over at Unsung Brewing Company in Anaheim. And again, just come out and hang out with us. We've got a few people signed up already. Uh, we'd love for you to tell us you're coming in advance. Cantinacast.com slash RSVP is how you can do that. There you go. I and think I made all these. I won't. Yeah, and once you plug Patreon, well, what did we do last week for Patreon? This was this was a lot of fun. We didn't get very far, but it was a lot of fun. <laughs> so last last week we tried to re envision the Star Wars series, the saga, the Star Wars, Skywalker saga, as though we were Marvel executives and trying to make it more Marvel esque. And so we Star did the, Wars Cinematic Universe. <laughs> Star Wars Cinematic Universe was the title. We kind of laid the groundwork for what we felt like was what made the cinematic universe, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, uh, successful. And so we tried to kind of fit pieces and and shape the story uh, into that mold, if you will. And I thought it was a lot of fun. We just didn't get past the Phantom Menace, but that's my fault. We got I do through, apologize. We got through phase one, wave one, <laughs> to take a book out of High Republic. Yeah. So basically, we got what leads into Phantom Menace, and then what might come immediately after Phantom Menace before we start going into what will directly lead into Attack of the Clones. And I thought it was a lot of fun. We had a good conversation. Oh, it, it was very interactive as well with the, the folks on the live chat, which I thought was even better. So if you're interested in checking that out, I, I am hoping to have time to do a little bit of a, uh, a teaser for that to get it in the mainstream so you guys can hear some of that stuff. But things have been really busy lately, so I apologize. But uh, cantinacast.com slash Patreon. I think that one is available anywhere at the $2 tier and up. And if so you don't you uh, check it out, yeah, and that's going to be, I mean, at this rate, Rogue Squadron will be out by the time we're done with this series of shows. So yeah, uh, right, yeah. There you go. The uh, he, the second sequel trilogy will be out <laughs> hundred years from now. Oh, uh, okay. And then this week we have to do the Inquisitors. We're out of time. Like, so if anything massive breaks on Thursday. It's just going to be a bonus show or something. I don't know, we'll figure it's gonna it out. It's going to be a four or five hour show. We're going to do all of it at once. <laughs> We're just going to live stream from now all the way in through celebration. Yep. Just yep. leave the cameras on, lights on, just go to sleep on camera. Oh, and I got um, I got buttons ordered. They're on their way. They'll be here. I've got stickers coming. We have a bunch of goodies. I've got a ton of books that I'm going to give away. I'm trying to entice you guys to come out to the the uh, podcast show. Um, T-shirts. Um, what else? I don't you know. Have t-shirts? Maybe. We'll see okay. if they get here in time. Um, <laughs> You're ordering stuff. Not even sure it's gonna be here. Yeah. Well, the buttons and the uh, stickers, I'm positive, will be here. I don't know about the shirts though. That one's right. gonna be a little sketchy. So. And but hey, you if you are, those. <laughs> yeah, if you are at celebration, we will be at the podcast meetup, uh, and that's open for both podcasters as well as listeners on Thursday night, which I believe is over at the uh, Anaheim Hilton Hotel, I believe. I'm uh, just going to go where you, t where you drop me off. That's all. I have no idea. Right. Yeah. That's where, that's wherever I'm told to go basically. Yep. This is why, this is why I put in my calendar. <laughs> Otherwise I don't know where I'm at. But anyway, so we'll be there as well in that evening, uh, enjoying the festivities over there and hope to run into you guys and, and meet some of you that we don't catch during the convention. Okay. And with that, uh, we'll see you guys in a couple of days for the Inquisitorious. See you then. You're still listening? Wow, that's amazing. Well, I'm here to give you the disclaimer. Normally we do a big, long, drawn-out disclaimer thing saying what's what and who's what and all that other stuff, but I think you guys kind of know that Lucasfilm and Disney have uh, no affiliation with us at all, uh, and we have none with them. Uh, we talk about Star Wars, which is their property and all that other good, fun stuff, uh, but I think you can tell which is our stuff and which is their stuff. If you can't, well, then send a lawyer to send an email to me, and I'll be glad to chat with them. Other than that, you know what's what, so that's your disclaimer. <laughs>